This is Bruce Ruffer, and this is the moment you've all been waiting for. It's time for the MMA Halls! Relax, everybody. We're here. We're live. It's Wednesday night. The UFC, this is your next card that's coming your way. We have a break in action over there, but the MMA holes never stop. We're live here, streaming across the world with our closest friends in the live chat. Make sure you hit that like button over there and stay wonderful, wonderful. wonderful, wonderful. We have a very nice show for you planned tonight. It's actually a magical show. 25 years ago, something special happened. A star was born in the UFC. And tonight on the show, I am extremely excited about having this guest. This guest has never been on the show before, so I want you guys to give him a warm welcome in our little phone over here, okay? So everyone smash that button, get out of your seats, a round of applause for our guest, Mike Goldberg. Let's go! Oh my god, how you booing? You can't boo him! You gotta stand up, you gotta cheer! There we go, there we go, Mike Goldberg live on the show! You're awesome, bro. That is that is unbelievably cool. <laughs> Did you hear they tried to boo that you? That is unbelievably cool. <laughs> yeah, and but but I have a question, Chris. If, yes. If Jesse's not with you, does that make this the MMA hole, <laughs> or are you just large enough to be the MMA hole? My MMA as hole. introduced by the better voice of the <laughs> octagon, Bruce Buffer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Chell Sonnen called us the MMA ho. So I mean, whatever you'd like uh, to call us. <laughs> Chell is uh, is a red belt in wit, a wordsmith extraordinaire, and one of my favorite people in the world. So <laughs> hey, if Chell takes the time to give you any kind of moniker, take it, use it, <laughs> attach to his followers. And let's all just get get millions of followers. What do you think, Chris? <laughs> yeah, today, fun fun story. Uh, today, I, I shot a little zinger at him on Twitter, and he forgave me. He said he forgave us on Twitter, so thank God, because I don't want to get on his bad side. Oh, <laughs> uh, You know, I always talk to Chael. We have a great friendship, obviously. I called his fights and then worked with him at Bellator on the air, at the UFC on the air. And uh, Goldie and the Gangster, we always joke what a, what a team that, that we would make on a broadcast. Um, but he's, he's funny because I'll throw certain things at him and he'll be like, you know, Goldie, I, I, I'd like to be aware of exactly what you're talking about. But let me jog my memory here. Wait a second here. Let me, let me go back and think because I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to. But if you're referring to what I think you might be referring to, I might be interested in what you're asking if I'm interested in. That's pretty good, Chael, wasn't it? <laughs> that was actually pretty good. He can I go a long time and say a little bit. It's, it's, <laughs> it's an absolute skill. It's a skill, and he's great at it. I it, love Chael. It really is amazing what he's done post-UFC. I mean, he's, he's done incredible yeah. stuff inside the cage. But outside of it, uh, gaining the million followers on uh, YouTube, and everyone's talking about him. He's doing commentary. He's a big personality. I mean, it's really – he's a good businessman, huh? He's a, he's a great businessman. And, you know, 
Here, I can say because I was recently at a conference in Miami at the Fountain Blue with my wife, and the keynote speaker was Magic Johnson. And Irvin Magic Johnson will tell you that now he's a businessman. And, and one could say, even though he's one of the best of all time, that he's a better businessman than he truly was basketball player because he's been so successful. Mm -hmm. A little bit of a stretch with Magic, but with respect to Shale, he may be a better businessman than he was a fighter, which still makes him a great fighter. But yeah, he's a heck of a businessman. He's a heck of a wordsmith. He's easy to get along with. He's educated. He's knowledgeable. And he's entertaining. And more than anything, Chris, much like you and Jesse do on your show, much like our MMA fans love, we, lo we want to be entertained. It's, it's not brain science, right? <laughs> it's not rocket surgery. As uh you know, I probably said that wrong on the air over the years, you know? I mean, my precision hasn't always been precise, but Shale's one of the best at it, that's for certain. You know what I love about you? You're human. I mean, that is the beauty of Mike Goldberg. Like, it, it, there's a lot of memes going out there. I'll put something up really quick over here. This is the best. Boom. Virtually identical. The best. <laughs> I mean, this is the best meme of all time. I mean, what are your thoughts when you see this on the screen? Wow, that's a goofy face. What was what was I doing there? Like seriously, and and my hair. Why was it orange? That, that's what I think. But I I I think wow, that's that's pretty cool. That, that, that's pretty cool. And when and when years ago, I think it was season two of Allers, and The Rock says on social media, as my good buddy Mike Goldberg would say, "Here we go, second season," and I'm like. And I've got people texting me and stuff, Chris. And I'm like, what, what are you guys talking about? The Rock? Like, you know, and I met him. He had been at UFCs. We had pimped some of his movies before that. But I'm just like, wow. And so I must have spent three hours on that five second clip, just hitting it over and over again. I bet. The entire day. Just, you know, I'm having a bad morning. I, I look up the Rock. And I'm like, oh, buddy, Mike Glover could say, here we go. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it, it's very well appreciated. Because I know the fans dig the catchphrases that that kind of happened. They 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 weren't premeditated. Um, they just kind of happened over the years, and virtually identical is one of them. And uh, it's cool that the fans still live by some of those phrases. So I totally respect it. Not the best picture of me. <laughs> But a meme's a meme, right? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, if they're talking about you, it's good. Good or bad, it doesn't matter. At least they're talking about you. That's what you want, right? Amen. So uh, way back, my first job out of school, I was in Sarasota, Florida, Chris. And uh, we were small market attached to Tampa. And so there were the sports broadcasters in Tampa. And I was a 6 and 11 guy in Sarasota. They did a poll in the newspaper. Best and worst sportscaster. I won both. <laughs> uh, awesome. how, how did I win both? Like, you won overall because you are getting people to have an opinion on you. Good, bad, or indifferent, spell your name right. So much to your point. I guess winning both, even though one of them wasn't the greatest win, is, uh, is the way we want to be. We want to be recognized and we want to leave an impression with people. Sometimes you got to wear the black hat, right? Sure. Listen, Mike, I got to say this. When, when I got the text, when Big Mo sent me a message, and by the way, shout out to Big Mo, love that guy. When he sent me the message and he's like, would you be interested in talking to Mike Goldberg? I almost shit myself. I'm not going to lie. I don't get starstruck. In any way, there were two times on this show where I was like, okay, this is bigger than me right now. This is a little crazy. It was Bruce Buffer, and we've become yeah. friendly with Bruce. He's such a nice guy. And then you. You come in, and I was like, I, I, my wife was in the shower. I ripped the curtain over. I was like, Mike fucking Goldberg is in my phone right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's and, and Jesse probably said, and I haven't met her, but I know from watching your show, <laughs> Um, she probably said, so what? She like, close the shower, I'm freezing in here. And then later, I hope she gave me a little love, but yeah, she's probably like, get the hell out of here, Chris. I'm showering. You know what? Watch your kid. You're right. That's exactly, she has like, she keeps everything inside. I wear everything outside. Like my emotions on my sleeve, right? But her, it's yeah. like, that's cool. You know, and I was like, do you understand who this is? Like, I mean, I think about you. I mean, it's got to be nauseating, right? Everyone asks you to reiterate the same stories over and over again, you know, but it's the 25 year anniversary since you started with the UFC and you got your Reebok jacket on over there. That's pretty freaking cool. So, I mean, this has got to be incredibly nostalgic for you to think back on all the old memories right incredibly incredibly and it just 
it's a plethora of emotions. I mean, there's highs, there's lows, there's there's sadness because I miss the family in which we were at the UFC and I was part of for 19 years. Um, there's all the great stops on the ride. There's the fact that Joe and I will forever be blessed by many, by most, I, I would humbly say, Chris, to be considered the soundtrack of the Ultimate Fighting Championship from, you know, renegade sport and, you know, and two men will enter the octagon, only one will leave to a global dominant accepted form of mixed martial arts exactly as it was envisioned by Lorenzo Fertitta so all of those memories are so great in the in the great fights and the stops and seeing the world and having the laughs and I mean we were at a we were at one of Joe's comedy shows in England one night and this was many many years ago and Joe started talking about soccer and how it was kind of ridiculous that you wouldn't use your hands God gave you two hands the laughter kind of like it died down a little bit. And then the queen, may she rest in peace. But then Joe started talking about the royal family. And I looked at Eddie Bravo and Mark Delagrati and I'm like, dudes, do we need to get out of here before we get mugged? I mean, we know Joe can handle himself. And so can Eddie and so can Mark. And they can all protect me. But it was like, wow, the hush over the crowd. So I, I remember things like that. And then I'm, I'm saddened. I'm saddened because Jeff Blatnick, is no longer with us. Kevin Randleman is no longer with us. AJ, Rumble, we just lost Rumble recently. He's no longer with us. Oh man, I mean, I go back to Sean Tompkins and Sean Tompkins and his early passing and the one that is most prominent in my life, not, not that that should separate the others, but Bruce Connell, my producer, the, the guy who got me into the UFC. It's been, it's, it's going to be, I think, four years since his passing in March. And it, it, it saddens me because I have the memory. Susie, who was my little sister, she was our makeup person at the UFC. She was our makeup person at Fox when I was doing college football. Susie, you know, lost her battle with cancer uh, a few years back. So they're all good memories today, but there's some sadness as I go back and, and look at some of those pictures and know that some of my dear friends are no longer with us. And uh, I've shed a few tears today. I won't lie. I won't lie. I did catch a little bit of you on Ariel today. And I did see I did see the uh, part where, where you where Rumble was brought up. And that slimy bastard, Ariel, pulled the tears out of you. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it is. <laughs> That's funny you say that. We had a joke. I know you're close the Rams that. went to the Super Bowl and Dick Vermeil was coaching. Yeah. Kurt Warner was from the Arena League to, you know, to the Super Bowl. We had a joke at Fox Sports News that every interview you had to get Coach Vermeil to cry. And uh, I, I, I hit about 800, I, and they were very pleased with that. So, yeah, that uh, <laughs> slimy Ariel Helwani, he got me emotional. <laughs> I have a little history with Ariel. I mean, he's he's another one, very successful. It's crazy. It, it really is wild yes. what he's done with himself, too. So as much as I tease about Ariel, I mean, the guy is very successful. And he's been, I mean, you guys have a really good relationship, too. I mean, known yes. each other for a long time, right? Very long time, and we've been there during the tough times for each other. And I've always had a lot of respect for Ariel. And, and he, has, he has interviewed me at the times when the world had an opinion or perception that was not entirely correct, was, was very off base. And he gave me a forum and he allowed me to discuss those different things over the years, Chris. And during those interviews, he asked me the tough questions. Mm -hmm. And I would expect nothing less because yeah. I had nothing to hide. And he gave me a forum to do that. He gave me a forum to celebrate my 100th. He gave me a forum when the UFC had gone away. He gave me a forum when Bellator was there. And I, and I gave him in return, I hope, and I know he feels this way, some great interviews and some great insight to, you know, what you kindly say, the, the human side of Mike Goldberg, the, the human side of Goldie that, that a lot of people don't really know because we were on the air talking about guys and girls in their underwear fighting in a cage most of the time. So... We didn't have these forums, and yeah, he's a he's a very loyal friend. He's he's overcome a lot of obstacles and a lot of dudes who didn't want him in this business. And I could not be happier for Ariel's success, especially in these last few years, as he's branched out doing the boxing and the wrestling and and everything. It's a dream come true for the dude, and sure. I, I've had a lot of dreams come true as well. So yeah, he's a very loyal and uh, a very valued friend, no question about it.
I, and I found it fascinating when you were telling your story about how you uh, got into the UFC. I'm going to show this picture that's been floating around the internet. Uh, December 21st, 1997. Um, they basically just kind of like threw you to the wolves, right? You weren't the type of guy that was into this world of mixed martial arts. Am I correct about this? You are 100%, 1,000% correct. Your precision on that is precise. In fact, um, but I knew the producer. I knew Bruce. And Bruce and I, so if you go back to the, the, the Connells, the Connell family, Scotty Connell, Bruce's father, was one of the founding fathers at ESPN from the technical side, from the programming side. He was a, a high-level executive at NBC, and he was one of the guys who put the entertainment sports programming network on the air and tried to fill 24 hours a day. Thus was the side business of CONCOM, Connell Communications. His son, Bruce, CONCOM is still in charge of, of everything. Bruce, he's no longer with us. Uh, but CONCOM as a unit, as a team, still handles all the production needs for the UFC. So Brucey was also one of the top producers of the NHL on ESPN. And I happened to get a job at ESPN doing the National Hockey League, which was a dream come true because I'm a hockey player. I uh, started playing when I was five. And Brucey just knew my enthusiasm. We had a great friendship from doing hockey together. And he said, and I've, I've said it many times, go, they go, they go, they got to get for you to Japan. You got to take a jujitsu class. And like, I, you know, the, all I heard was gig in Japan and I was there. Uh, but I but I knew everything was going to be OK when Elaine McCarthy told me that R is a Portuguese. Uh, it's not Royce Gracie. It's not Renzo. It's Hoist and Henzo. And Big John and, and, you know, the late great Olympic gold medalist Jeff Blatnick took me right under their wing. And I always live by the moniker. Less is more. When you're sitting next to John Madden, you, you don't have to be John Madden. So mm -hmm. I never attempted to be Chris. I had that same relationship with Joe and I learned on the job because I could tell some stories and get excited. Wasn't ex wasn't exactly sure what was happening. But when somebody <laughs> said the fight was over, I knew to get excited. You know, that, that's how it started. So did they tell you, hey, listen, we want you just to paint the picture of what you see? Like, what did they tell you? How do they want you to present their product? Back then with SEG, it was we were in the John McCain years and uh, and John McCain said the, the late there's too many lates I mean but Senator McCain he was right at the time I mean it, it was a spectacle before a sport and so really it was Brucey telling me to Goldie just you know tee up Latnik have fun have energy do your homework on the fighters look at the bios and you know let Jeff do his thing and these are the basic rules and there's, you know, the famous story about being in the ballroom and John telling me to come snuggle and Bob and Ellen Myrowitz walking by at that time and going, oh, the new kid, he's, he's learning on the job. And, I mean, John hadn't even bought me lunch. I mean, and we were seriously dating as he showed me guard and, and he had me pass guard to side mount and, you know, we didn't go north south, but, you know, it was, it was good. It was good. And, and so that was, that was my thing early on was just stay in my lane and mm. my lane was was pretty narrow at the time but i was next to a guy who had a super mega highway with 27 lanes and jeff blatnick and i just let it ride and i got to know people spent a lot of time with randy couture and his family before that fight against maurice smith back in japan and i just kind of i kind of vibed with everybody and uh you know, the rest is history i suppose it's amazing and, and you bring up hockey i love hockey i'm a big ranger fan actually oh. Um, and you know I, what? I, I love the Rangers because of, well, because of many things, but I love the Rangers because Marion Gabrick was with the Rangers for a while. And you'd be like, Gabby, why Gabby Goldie? Well, I was the very first voice of the Minnesota Wild back in 2000. And Gabby was our number one pick, scored our first shorthanded goal, scored our first goal, scored our first power play goal, broke records. And Marion was a very good friend. So when he went to the Rangers, I dug it. I, I, I was like, wow, we can go to MSG. We're in New York. My son and I go and we get to go see Gabby. And they're the Rangers. It's an original six team. They happen to play in the world's most famous arena. And if you uh, and if you can't love the Rangers, who are you going to love? I mean, and, it, <laughs> and I go back to the World Cup of Hockey and you look at like Richter and Leach and especially Mike Richter. I mean, I think he won that World Cup of Hockey 
for the U.S. many decades ago. A lot of people, Chris, are probably going with the, the World Cup. I, I thought that was soccer. I know but exactly what you're talking about. You did it because of the Rangers and Mike Richter, man. He was the man. So, That's my mom's favorite um, right there. She loved. She there was, you go. She would have left my dad for Richter, no doubt about it. <laughs> you know, and who and whose wife would not leave their husband for for King, for Lundquist? I mean, Eric oh. Lundquist's most handsome. And I mean, putting a mask on that guy is just, it's larceny. Like, don't hide that beauty or... Or perhaps it's the other way, protect that beauty. But it, it's good to know that uh, Mike Richter could have been your stepfather. But, you know, <laughs> dad held in strong. That's a good thing. <laughs> you know, it's funny that you bring up Lundquist. I, I had the pleasure of DJing his, uh, it was a Gotham Magazine uh, photo shoot thing that he did. And really? I was doing the DJ work for him. And I was, I'm, a, of course, a big Ranger fan. So I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to meet Lundquist. When he walked in. The women left all the guys and ran to the door to see this guy. <laughs> I was like, "What? How do you? Yeah. How are you that good looking? Like it's crazy." I, it, 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 it's not fair. It, it's not fair to. I mean, look at look at the reaction that the king got walking in and all the women, and then look at that meme you showed him. Virtually identical. <laughs> I mean, I would be gone. I mean, I, I couldn't. I couldn't score in the ocean. I mean, you know, with a bunch of beach balls. <laughs> And I, yeah, he's a, and he's a, a hell of a goaltender too. But but it's funny you say that. I read a I read a post the other day, and uh, it was Paige Van Zant, and Paige was talking about an NFL player who is very attractive. I can't remember the exact player. Um, there's probably many of them. But um, she said, and and I think I'm single now. And of course, my first thought, and I'm sure yours, is like, oh, so Paige's got a crush on this guy. No, she was saying that Austin, Austin <laughs> Vanderford. Her husband, of course, he had such a crush on this NFL guy that she was going to be single because Austin was going to leave her for this NFL guy. So, yeah, there's some athletes out there, that's for certain. <laughs> so, I mean, I can only think – so, now, all right, let's let's get back to you here, okay? And I want to I talk more hockey. I want to talk more hockey with you because I love hockey. Uh -huh. But um, I, I do want to talk about the fact that you had Joe Rogan next year for all those years. Yeah. And I mean, there has to be crazy stories. There has to be something out there after parties or something where shit got a little wild with Goldie and Rogan. Can we get at least one solid juicy story? I don't know, blow women, hookers. What are we talking here, Goldie? What do we got? Wow. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, that's, that's a, a lot of yes. So yeah, um, well, one of them was in England, but you know, I, was never a big, I was more of a hockey player. So, you know, give me a couple cocktails afterwards and, and I'm good to go. And, you know, Joe would have every form and fashion of, you know, THC. And some of them were like Listerine strips. And, you know, I tried a few and I got silly and <laughs> Joe laughed at me. Um, so it was, it, it was pretty crazy. I mean, the thing about Joe is that he always wanted his steak dinner after the show and he wanted his peeps around. And we would just chill and then we would hang out. And, and here's one for you. All right, well, it was uh, MGM and I can't remember, there was a, li a little bar at MGM that was pretty cool. And Michael DeSabado, OH, great Ohio guy. Um, Michael DeSabado, his brother Adam, the whole DeSabado family they have won more state wrestling championships in the state of Ohio than any family. They wrestled at the Ohio State University. De Sabado is very, very close with Coley, very close with Randleman, Lance Palmer. I mean, Gray Maynard went to Michigan State, but Gray from St. Edwards High School. So they were paying me back then a little bit of cash to wear these cage fighter shirts. And I had it on in the bar. And Joe looks at this shirt and he goes, what the fuck? And I was like, what, dude? I go, I'm getting paid to wear it. And he goes, Goldie, they cannot pay you. No one can pay you enough money to wear that fucking ugly shirt all night long in this bar. You need to go up and change. And I was like, can you buy me a drink? He's <laughs> like, I got a drink. Go up and change. And I did. And I did. But I thank Cage Fighter because they're awesome. But yeah, he called me out on, uh, he called me out on that one and I think, you know, the time when I was going to go to the WWE was was very comical because all Joe did was call it porn. Dude, you're not going to go do porn. You're not going to go do porn. I'm like, Joe, it's a good offer. My kid did it. Bro, it's porn. I need you. Like, I don't want to work with somebody else. You know, it's got to be porn. 
It's got to be porn. And I'm like, it's not porn, but right now this porn seems to pay better than, you know, or have more security. He's like, you just wait. Mm -hmm. And a few days later, after Joe had a conversation with uh, Lorenzo and Dana, um, I was staying on the uh, R-rated movies. I didn't go X, I guess, in Joe's <laughs> opinion. And then there's many nights in Brazil and other places that uh, would be better left in the locker room, <laughs> if you would say. I but those are a couple moments. Joe would, uh, Joe would always give me shit, man, and, and I loved it because if you're going to be a true brother, you got to be able to take jabs from your true brother, and, and Joe definitely called me on it. The one thing on the air that I wish – I wish I would have been glib enough at the time to do is when I, I mistakenly said choked out by Kimura and I was looking down at my notes on a particular fighter and I saw Kimura and I saw choke and they were back to back and it just, it was, it was the last few fights and Joe said, how do you, how do you get, how do you choke somebody out with a Kimura? And I was like, I was like, well, okay, first of all, you're not supposed to correct your partner on the air, but you know, Joe was like, he, he got it. I'm like, okay. I wish, Chris, at the time, I just would have fucking said, I don't know, Joe, you're the black belt, you tell me. <laughs> then that would have been a great ending to that meme. Um, but there were times like that, too. Like, talking about his comedy show on the air. And I go, Joe, everybody get his comedy show. He's doing it on Netflix, blah, 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 blah. Joe, you are the funniest man I've ever met. He goes, uh, no, I'm not. I go, no, you're right, you're not, but you're my partner, and I'm just trying to help you sell some DVDs. <laughs> so we would have a lot of fun times. Bruce Connor would be in our ear all the time, Chris, and he'd be like, bring back, boys. Bring it back, boys. <laughs> you know, there's fights going on in front of you. So if uh, if Brucey didn't remind us that we, we were supposed to be focused on what we were supposed to be focused on, we might have had a few comedy specials of our own. That's uh, that's for sure. That's for sure. It did seem like you guys were like brothers. It really did. The way you, there was kind of a little bickering here and there. There was a little bit like th <laughs> the banter back and forth was so much fun. And 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 I don't know. Maybe I'm biased. I have no idea. But uh, like now with the crew, I, I said this on the air the other night. I said my problem with the UFC now is I feel like there's too many guys. I feel like we got too many guys yeah. at the desk there. When it was just you and Joe, it was a back and forth. I mean, even then, you guys were kind of going wild over each other. Now there's three people, and it was just, just craziness going on. I feel like Anik doesn't have a chance to breathe because there's a lot of stuff going on inside of him. But when you and Joe were doing it, it was a charm. There was something that was, like, beautiful. There was a chemistry between you two. Even if you guys went back and forth, took shots at each other, it was still fun. You know, and I feel like they missed that. They, I don't know. Maybe am I off on this? I, uh, I, I do not disagree. I do not disagree. And then that's with a lot of respect to the guys doing it now and to JA and DC and Bisbing and, you know, everybody who's, who's at the broadcast table at the desk. And um, Megan does a great job. Karen Bryan is someone who I always loved. And, and they, they're my family. So, but yeah, it's different. It's different. And I think that's the one thing that in the bigger picture, you know, when the sale was, was maybe going to happen and stuff, there was a lot of, well, Joe's so good. Joe can just be Joe with whoever because he's the man. Well, you know what? Certain quarterbacks need to be with certain wide receivers. Mm -hmm. And that wide receiver is still the focal point of the offense. But you can be Jake DeLome. You, you don't have to be, you know, I, I'll say Tom Brady because my Bengals beat the crap out of him in the second half on Sunday <laughs> night because he went to that school up north. He is the GOAT. And Sean Shelby's first cousin, by the way, if you did not know that. Um, Tom Brady, Sean Shelby, first cousin. Are they so really? I, I didn't know that. Child. Yeah. Not, not a word of a lie. I believe that their moms are sisters. But, yeah, they are first cousins. And, um you just have to get it done and get the ball to the star in the right places. And not everybody can do that. Not everybody can stay in their lane, as they say. Not everybody understands their role. And I had a renegade guy in Joe. I mean, I had T.O. I had Randy Boss, man. I mean, I had I had Ocho Cinco. <laughs> you know what? Whoever you want to go out there and talk about, that was Joe. And it was my job to make it very easy for him to just have fun and do what he does best. And that is to educate and entertain the great combat fans around the world. I always say, Chris, I was the one with all the plays on my wrist. Mm -hmm. And I made everything peaceful for Joe. If I audible this and that, Joe didn't have to worry about it. I was going to get him the ball. And the greatest compliment that Joe has ever given me as far as on the air, Chris, is he said years ago, he said, people don't realize how good Mike Goldberg is because they don't understand what – 
it is like to do play by play on a major production like the UFC. You have all these voices in your ear and these counts and you got to hit them three, two, one, and Brucey's in my ear and we're going to replays and this and that. And he says, things can be falling apart behind the scenes and Goldie will not let anybody, it's called no on air effect. Nobody at home knows. That's the greatness of Mike Goldberg. And that is what Joe said years ago. And um, I, I took that to heart because that, that really is my job. That's the job of a good play-by-play guy is just handle all the chaos and let everybody else just worry about doing their job and focus on what they need to focus on. Yeah, I mean, that's a massive compliment right there. Did you ever have a time where you're like, there was just too much going on? You're like, guys, let me breathe for a second here. Like, I got this. Have, has that ever happened? <laughs> of course, many, many times. <laughs> Like, Joe, shut the fuck up, Brucey, man. No. I mean, Brucey and I were so close. Bruce Condell and I, my God, I mean, from ESPN in 95 up until 2016, my last UFC, we did eight, eight trillion shows together. Um, I, I might have asked for that, you know, little pause and a breath to gather myself, and mm. Brucey would probably tell me that that wasn't permitted. So, uh, yeah, I tried, but I don't know if Brucey let me back in the day. <laughs> It was chaotic, man. I'll, I, I'll tell you one. So we're in Sacramento and Tito's fighting. And Tito's in the main event. And we were kind of looking at tapes. And Brucey said in the meeting before the show, he said, uh, Lorenzo and Dana and Frank, they, they want you guys to get to the main event quicker. Because we'd always do the on camera before the main event. And he said, one question. Get on the main, get on cam. Tee up the main event, it's Chris and Goldie, boom, you know? It's the A-hole and the G-berg, and here we go. One question, and I asked the one question. Joe and Bruce, he's like, go. And I'm, and now, when I'm on my stick mic and my earbuds, I don't have access to the talk back to Bruce in the truck, Chris, like I do when I'm on the headset and I'm sitting at the desk. And he's like, keep going. And I'm thinking like, what the fuck? And then oh, wow. Bruce, he's like, in my ears, like, I'll explain later. Keep going. Keep. I mean, we were probably on camera for 12 minutes. Well, someone had gone out to have a cigarette break before the main event, and they dropped their cigarettes. This is actually a true story. And the person fell over the rail <laughs> at Arco Arena and fell reaching for a cigarette. So all the doctors and all the medical staff went outside of the arena to attend to this person who had had a bad fall, a bad injury. Thankfully, everything worked out okay. But we couldn't start the fight without any doctors or anyone in the building. So oh, wow. Brucey told me that later, and it made sense. But we went from one question, hurry up, Goldie, less is more, less is more, to stretch a little bit more. We're in a long, long rain delay. Brucey, it's not raining. Doesn't matter. It's raining in here. So <laughs> that's one of them where I had to, hey, it's like I said before, that's one of them where I had to go to the audible. Wow. Uh, by the way, hey, if you're just jumping into the stream right now, we're live with Mike Goldberg. 25 years ago, he uh, joined wow. the UFC, uh, celebrating a glorious, uh, monumental uh, moment in time that is locked in forever. A lot of people speaking finally of Goldie. Even to this day, he's still strong on BYB, so go check out BYB's broadcast. He's been all over the place doing that as well. I got many questions over here. I'm trying to rattle through them as quickly as possible. Uh, you had been cage side to some of the craziest fights. And when I think of the Goldie era, I think of the Conor McGregor's, the Ronda Rousey's, I think about the Couture's and, you know, Tito's and whatever. Uh, like those stars, I feel like they're stars now, but they're not those stars. No offense, no disrespect for Sean O'Malley's or the Patty Pimblets. I think they're rock stars in their own way. But I feel like no one's, uh, let me put it like this. Conor, Ronda, Ronda, Brock. Those three right there, like just off the top of my head, I don't think there's ever been anyone as massive as those three. What do you think about that? Anderson, Anderson, BJ, Hughes, GSP, Jose Aldo before Connor took over. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. There, there's no question about it. And the, the heads that turned when those men and women walked into the octagon was a, a totally different level from what we had previously seen. Who's ever gonna forget the Iceman? Who, who is ever gonna forget everything Chuck Liddell was able to do? You got a dude with a mohawk and tattoos on his head. Try to take him down, can't take him down, soon gonna get knocked out. I mean, moving backwards, knocking out Bob, you know, Tito. Just the personalities that we had 
in the dominance that we had in the different weight divisions for a while was pretty crazy, Chris. We, we, we didn't have it until Stipe set that record in the heavyweight division. But, I mean, you can go with 35 when, you know, we first had the merger with WEC. You go Henenborough, you go Jose Aldo, you go BJ Penn, and then Frankie got in there. You had Matt Hughes and then GSP took over. You had Anderson Silva. You had John Jones. I mean, what gets any bigger than that? Then Ronda comes in and dominates forever as the women's divisions started to build. And, I mean, I'll never forget Ronda's debut in Anaheim and Liz Carmouche gets on her like a backpack. And I'm just like, this whole dream scenario, is that it's about to go south. As soon as that hand goes like this, and somehow Ronda fought through it, and um, man, did she put on some shows. But man, she could entertain as well. And that mean mug, and, and the, I mean, the violence with the arm bar, um, unbelievable. Some unbelievably talented and committed athletes. And, and then you add the Vitor Belfors and the Leoto Machidas and a guy like Rumble, who was a destroyer, or Vanderlei, or... Um, Obviously, I, I look at Rampage as, as one of those guys and many others, believe me. Um, yeah, it was a special time. It was a special era. And you can be a Jets fan your entire life, but I don't know as much success as you may have somewhere down the road. There'll only be one Joe Namath. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about. Has there been a moment, like, what's the one moment? It's probably a t difficult question, but, like, the one moment that stands out over any of them, like, holy shit, I can't believe I just saw that. Was there a uh, one moment that you could think of, like, I can't even believe I'm sitting here watching this? Yes. I, I'll, I'll give you two. I'll give you two. Okay. Um, and they both were scary as hell. The first was Terry Adam and Edson Barboza and a spinning heel kick because – Poor Terry Adam went down like Apollo did against Drago. I mean, mm. it was scary. The body stiffened up, boom. And it was, uh, it was like one of the sickest knockouts still to this day that we have ever, ever seen. And I remember being scared. Like, what? I mean, please get up. Please get up. And the, I mean, and Edson was respectful. Um, Joe, in those situations, when we would have those crazy finishes that were somewhat violent, he'd always be in the, in the truck. They're like, replay, replay, give me another look. Let's see this again. Let's see it. Like, no, like, ah, I don't want to see it again. <laughs> the other is, is Corey Hill. When Corey Hill broke his leg and he did not know that he had snapped it on the kick and he went back to settle his feet again and get back in his stance and just crumbled, I, I, I basically puked in my own mouth and I ended up doing it about a half a dozen times because that was the time where Joe kept saying, we like to see the replay. No, I don't want to see it again. And God bless Corey Hill. He came back and fought again. He came back and fought again and watching Anderson, you know, with the leg and then obviously Tim Sylvia's arm, there were different injuries over the years, but Corey's was so, so just horrible and and hard to watch and we had never seen it before and the thing that really made it so sickening in and so memorable in a sickening way is the fact that he didn't know and he went to step and he went to plant himself and he just crumbled down and the leg crumbled with him so those two moments i would say are two that in their own form and fashion if you will are two that i will i will never ever forget and you know, Anderson's front kick on Vitor and then Leoto doing it to Randy. Uh, those are pretty special as well. There, there are two calls that really stand out with me. Now, I got into the sport a little bit later than a lot of the people in my chat. But um, there, there are two that really, like, stick out. It's all over from you. And one of them is uh, Henderson knocking out Bisping. Um, I mean, oh. th the way he went out um, and your call, it's, it's like frozen in my mind. What was going through your mind when that happened, that, that knockout? Oh. That he truly has an H-bomb, and he just detonated it. <laughs> and I hope Michael's okay. Yeah. Uh, but the bill, and you know what made it, you know what made it so spectacular and probably added to the enthusiasm in my call, Chris, is all the buildup on the ultimate fighter mm -hmm. and the true hatred. Because, 
Hendo's a pretty mellow guy, man. Hendo doesn't get into the war of words much. And uh, he and the count, somebody's got to wear the black hat. Michael Bisping is always great at it. He always will be great at it. And he'll be the first to admit he prefers the black hat over the white hat. And man, did he get under Hendo's skin. And Hendo sent a message, and that H-bomb absolutely flattened him. And then the follow, boom, it's the crazy. hammer fist is what did it, right? And, yeah, that was, that was a definitive statement of, I told you what was going to happen. And when you wake up in a minute or two, your friends and family can tell you what happened. Because I know you don't know right now. Because I put you out cold. You went to sleep. Um, yeah, Hendo with that H-bomb was, was unbelievable. And I remember being in a bar with Michael and he said, you know, Goldie and his, you know, his British accent, which was, you know, and he's got the heavy one from Manchester. And, you know, so a couple cocktails in him. I'm not sure exactly, you know, what he's saying, but we have a great relationship. He's like, well, you know, I'm a good dude, man. I just people do things. I get mad and I can't stop myself. I can't help myself. But people need to know that I got a big heart. I got a family. I'm a father. I like I, I love people. I appreciate my fans. Everybody just thinks I'm a dick. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. About two minutes later, he's in a he's in a piss match with you know some guy at the bar, and they're and they're da 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 fuck you fuck up the fuck. And, and Michael just looks over at me. And he goes, "I told you, dude, I can't help myself. I, I'm trying. I can't help myself." And I was I, I'll never forget. I was just like Mike, you don't have to say anything to me, bro. Just you know have at it. This is good entertainment for me. I'm gonna grab another drink for both of us. You keep dealing with this hooligan. <laughs> The, the other fight that jumps into my head was the Chris Weidman versus Anderson Silva, the first one. That big shocking, uh, uh, you know, you know, the head moving around and then Weidman woo. catches him. Your call on that was fantastic. Now, I mean, the buzz in that arena must have been nuts as the belt goes to the other side. What was going through your mind with that call? Holy fuck, did that <laughs> really happen? And I, and I, you know, I guess if we really were uncensored... You know, if our if we were fully on Spotify, like Joe, we could have said that. Like, you have got to be fucking kidding. Me. That that would have been the call, right? Um, I I was a- absolutely in shock because we'd seen Chris, we'd seen Anderson do that mm. all the time. We'd seen him mess around. We'd see him get away with it, and then all of a sudden, pop, and then he's out. And I'm like, wow. It, it was Anderson was as dominant a fighter as anybody. And he was playing his game and he was showboating a little bit. He was entertaining and he got caught. And um, yeah, it, but my reaction inside was, holy fuck, I c- cannot believe that Anderson just got knocked out. Somebody finally got him. Somebody <laughs> finally got him goofing around and Anderson had to pay the price. That Here's was- another thing that I've said over the years. And I say the same thing about Matt Sarah knocking out George St. Pierre. There is no such thing as a lucky punch. There is such thing as a fortunate landing that night chris weidman was trying to hit anderson silva in the face he ends up tapping him on the chin in the right place down he goes matt sarah with the overhand he's trying to destroy gsp and knock him out and he did now if that lands here if it lands on the shoulder if it lands up here it does some damage but it doesn't finish the fight it lands here it lands here lights out Mm -hmm. so there's your fortunate landing but it's not a lucky punch because there was no luck when they threw the punch. That punch had bad intentions. And for Chris Weidman, Matt Serra, and many others at the time, Conor McGregor, Jose Aldo, that was not a lucky punch. That was a fortunate landing because it landed right on the chin of Jose Aldo. And, and I mean, go back to Carlos Condit and Dan Hardy. Like, I didn't even know, I didn't even know who won at the time. I, I was like, both guys are like throwing these long hooks and I'm like, what's going on? And, and I, I almost announced the wrong winner because they both went down at the same time. So yeah, that was, that was shocking. When, when that happened, that was probably the most surprised I ever was in a fight because of the fact that Anderson had never been caught and no disrespect to Chris. He's a, he's tough as they come, but Anderson was goofing around and he paid the ultimate price. No pun intended. It's wild to think about people are paying pay-per-views. People are paying top dollar to be in these events. 
and here you are front row seat and you get to call these fights and see these magical moments and there's so many memories i bet you have that I, like it's it's got to be wild like a, a night in your brain i would like to spend a whole night in your brain just trying to pick apart like all these crazy moments do you watch old fights to say oh i want to relive these moments or are they all stored in here are they still fresh uh, a little of both a little of both i've definitely been reminiscing the past couple of weeks and sure. thinking about old fights. I mean, you, you see my poster of, you know, Anderson and, and Nate in the background. Um, and then my, my new ventures with pro box TV, Roy Jones, Antonio Tarver, Paulie Malinaji, and then BYB extreme, Paulie Malinaji, Claudia Trejos are my partners on that. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're etched in my memory. I mean, I can, I can see Hendo, you know, knocking out Bisping. I can see Weidman doing it. I can visualize Corey Hill. I remember being in Abu Dhabi and uh, we had the witch doctor, Dr. Steve Friend. He told me, Frankie Edgar is going to beat BJ Penn today. And, and he's the kind of guy who I'd tell him my knee hurt and he'd press a spot behind my neck. He's like, it feel better? And I was like, he was such a cool dude. It didn't feel any better at all. But I was like, oh, wow, doc, I can't feel it at all. All I feel is you stick your finger in my neck right now. And I, he looked at me after Frankie beat BJ, and then and then Frankie did it again. Um, it's crazy. It's fun to look back at those those moments. And uh, I've been cutting some tapes for some different job prospects lately, and and pulling out some of the big ones. I just rewatched Ronda and Holly. Um, and man, I remember. You know, it takes a lot of energy to be a rock star. And Joe saying, "What do you mean? She's getting punched in the face right now." No, it's the bigger story, Joe. It was the fact that the fight was three months earlier than it was supposed to be because Robbie Lawler got hurt and Ronda was doing every single movie. And at the beginning of the fight, Joe talked about how Ronda didn't look as much in shape as she had in previous fights. How's how tying this beautiful picture together? And Joe took his brush and said, boom, that ain't, that ain't happening on this one. One of the many moments we had fun, right? I, I don't know what the fuck Golding means, right? but what's he talking about rock stars for right now? And I was just kind of, I was trying to be like, Picasso with my art and Joe just took a the big bottle of white out and flipped it on me. But we had a lot of white out over the years. Let's just say that. <laughs> there was one time with it that, man, now you got me thinking, man. Thank you so much. I, I needed this. Uh today's actually the five year anniversary of my dad's passing as well, which is crazy that it's on December twenty first. Um, so you know, I'm I, I'm heavy hearted to think about my dad. My dad was my biggest fan. So I have great memories at this point. You, you remember the good times and Man, he was so proud of me, and he, my 100th UFC party, he's right next to me at every moment, and man, I love him because he gave me, wow. put my brother and I in a position to succeed as young kids and play the game of hockey that we loved. Um, but as we look at uh, like these fun stories, there was a fight in the middle of nowhere. It was an early prelim. Nobody was there, and let's just say it was Jesse, your wife's fighting, and here comes Jesse. She's making her first trip to the octagon. She's walking up those steps for the first time in her mixed martial arts career. She's touching the fence of the world famous octagon for the first time as she gets set to make her long awaited UFC debut. She's checking the canvas. She's checking the bounce in the spring. And Joe just goes, dude, you are really trying to sell this fight, aren't you? I'm like, I'm trying as much as I can, bro. And that didn't help what you just did right there. <laughs> I was just trying to do something to get people excited about it. And literally, he called me out on it. He's like, bro, like, really? He just touched the fence? She just touched the canvas? So those little steps are like, man, Goldie, you are really working hard tonight. Well, thank you, Joe. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> he's not afraid. Well, I mean, I guess that's why he's so successful with his podcast and everything yeah. like that. He is not afraid to give it no matter. He could be talking to Elon Musk. It does not matter. He will let you know how he feels. Was there ever a time where you're like, like you had it? You're like, all right, Joe, shut the fuck up. <laughs> did you ever have that moment? Or did you just say, okay, we're brothers. I could just let this go. Both. <laughs> <laughs> Both. Uh, but ultimately, B, we're brothers. And, you know, if you, it, here's the deal. If you're going to work with someone with a strong personality like Joe, who tells it like it is, then if you ask him a question or you ask for him to critique your work, or you ask him for an opinion on how you might handle something in business, he's gonna tell you what he believes, but he's also going to tell you what you should hear, not mm. what you want to hear. And a lot of people don't want that. 
They just want to be coddled and they want to be told, yeah. you know, they're great, great. Oh, you're the greatest. You're the greatest. Oh, that call was perfect. That was bad. Oh, that was bad on me. Da, da. No, I mean, Joe would call me out. And yeah, there were times it wasn't easy. Like, mm. uh, because those are tough lessons going back to when your parents would, would do it to you. But the fact of the matter, and I have this relationship with big John McCarthy in a very, very positive way. Um, my true big brother is big John is if you want Joe to tell you something about something, be ready for the truth. And if we go back to, you know, Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise, you can't handle the truth. Then don't ask Joe. Um, so yeah, it took a little, it, it, it took a little biting of the lip, a little biting of the tongue, a few stitches in my tongue from here and there. But when I would reflect on it, I always realized that he was right. But most mm -hmm. importantly, Chris, what I realized is that the definition of true friendship is unbridled honesty. Sure. And never was there a time that Joe was doing it to be a dick or to put me down or, or to degrade me in any form or fashion. He was doing it to be a true friend and to be honest, to help me be a better man. Like he always talks about, to help me be the hero of my own movie. And so, yeah, as I realized that and grew a couple more layers of reptile skin, I, I was able to absorb it a lot more. But there were also more times where Joe truly had my back with positivity when things were going on. It could have been in my personal life, could have been in the professional, whatever it might be. And that dude was there for me. And like he's always said, Goldie will be my friend for life and Joe Rogan will be my friend for life. And so I, I appreciate it. But yeah, um, if you want your opinion, there were nights in which I would ask Joe what it is. And that that's OK. That's OK. I'm good with it. Uh, do you guys still keep in touch? Not as much as I wish we could. Mm -hmm. um, I'll shoot out some messages to him. He was here in Phoenix. It's, it's been a, a couple of years now. He was here in Phoenix and, and he had a comedy show and I was there. We. I mean, we sat up in his dressing room area after his comedy show probably for three and a half hours wow. and just shot the shit. I mean, we spent not just the times together on the road in the UFC, but hours and hours and hours doing those video games mm -hmm. and chilling and going to dinner and hanging out. And um, I, I, I just really am blessed to call him my friend and I'm really happy for his success. I was at the dinner years and years ago when he was talking about a podcast and it was a, a good friend of mine actually who had a company called Ustream, Brad Hunstable. Um, Brad went to West Point, did his master's at Ohio State and Brad had Ustream and that was where Joe first kind of started his podcast a couple of decades ago and I happened to be at that dinner that night. And I remember mm -hmm. Joe, that was one of the times where I got a tough message from Joe. Afterwards, you know, we were saying goodbye and he's like, bro, you like you're interrupted a few times. I'm trying to do business here. And and, and Brad and I were talking Ohio State football. Well, okay. as you know, and everybody else knows, Joe does not give a shit about any other sport. So he did not care about Ohio State football or anything else that had to do with anything other than MMA combat sports and the agenda. And, and obviously I knew I was a guest invited, but Brad asked me about the Buckeyes. So we talked about the Buckeyes. And uh, hey, here we are, uh, you know, many years later and hundreds of millions of dollars later that mm -hmm. Joe's podcast is is second to none. So it was pretty cool to be an insider in the early days as he started to do his thing. And But it's that part of Joe that I just described that I experienced that has made him so successful mm -hmm. because like it or not, he's going to tell you how he feels and he's he's going to do his homework. Sure. And he may not always be right in these big guests that he has on Chris, but he will never be unprepared when he does those interviews. And that's the thing I love and respect about him the most. Well, absolutely. I mean, there's no doubt what he's done is, is amazing, especially that massive uh, deal with Spotify it blew my mind when I heard that. I was like, wow, that's insane what he's doing. I mean, when, when I was a kid, it was Howard Stern. Like I was like, I was obsessed with Howard Stern. And then Joe had a relationship with Howard. Hey, did Joe ever tell you any stories about Howard Stern? Because I know there was some weird shit going on between us. Not, not, not in depth, but I knew there was a, there was a, there was a, a, a bro love a little bit. And he didn't really tell me any of the backstories. Uh -huh. But I will tell you, the minute that Joe signed the $100 million deal with Spotify, the first thing I said to people was exactly what you just brought up, Chris. And that's like Howard Stern put satellite radio on the planet because mm -hmm. people were now told they could not just listen to Howard on their 
regular car stereo. They had to get this Sirius XM and they had to have satellite radio, channel 100, Howard Stern. And Spotify did the same thing with, you know, the, Joe's podcast. And uh, it, it's just an amazing thing that the numbers were the same because it was 100 million for Howard to go. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like watching the documentary and watching the movie, that movie was kind of cor it was kind of corny, but it's still, you know, Howard's movie was good and you get to understand the entertainment part of it. Um, yeah, there's there's a little bit of similarity there. And it's so funny you bring up Howard before I kind of did that comparison because that's the first thing I thought when Joe signed the big ticket was Spotify. I, Spotify I, wants to be in the podcast world. Well, they are now because they have Joe Rogan. It's like a passing of the torch. It's wild. I mean, and Joe used to go on Howard and they had that chemistry and then, I don't know, something happened and then Joe just started doing his own thing and now look at him. It's crazy. Now, this is a question I got to ask you because uh, people in the chat I saw were putting it out there as well. You, ha I, you haven't been on JRE's podcast? Have you been on this podcast? I, I have not. And so back during our time together, uh, there was nothing that scared me more than going on Joe's podcast because Joe gets people to tell the truth and only the truth and nothing but the truth. Mm -hmm. And he'll work in different ways to get you to do that. And I had some things that... You know, like every person, every human being on the planet wants to keep in the locker room, my hockey, my hockey mentality. So I'm like, oh, shit. Well, if I go on Joe's podcast, man, I'm going to have to like, oh, my God, he's going to ask me about this. And, and I'm going to have to tell him the same answer that I told him over over drinks last night and at his comedy show backstage with Listerine sticks or whatever the fuck they were. <laughs> and I'm not going to be able to, to give my, you know, very generic answer. Because if I do, Joe's going to call me out. Um, so, so I have not been. Um, a lot of it had to do with Joe would bring people into studio. Um, someday, I, I hope I will be. Uh, but it doesn't. A lot of people, you know, might might think it irks me or I, mean, I feel disrespected by it or something. I, I don't at all. I, I don't at all. The, the relationship I have with Joe is is much deeper than a UFC broadcast or a podcast or a video game or a comedy show, well, it, it, it's it's a brotherhood. Mm. And someday I'll get to have some laughs with Joe on uh, the, the J-R-E as it is. And I look forward to that day. But yeah, I I haven't. I mean, maybe he's waiting for episode 100,000. Mm. You know, make me very special. I, I don't know. He's, he's getting up there. It's the thing um, that- But sometime, sometime. And the thing that like I always think about, because I don't know, it's weird because I think of you as the GOAT when it comes to the UFC commentary. It's not because I have you on now. I've said this on previous streams and why we started what we're doing. We honestly, one of the reasons why we started was Joe was doing a fight companion and we were like, he doesn't interact with the community, the chat and the internet. Let's, let's I interact with everybody. But another reason, and this is pretty wild, people watch our live streams and mute the broadcast now. They mute the commentators and listen to dopey me and my wife that don't know half of what they know, but it's it's not you and Joe. You know, like that, once that stopped, people started scattering and finding other ways to enjoy the UFC. And what's weird to me is when Joe was asked about uh, the best commentator or whatever, I'm um, paraphrasing, but he basically said that John Anik is the guy. And I was like, hold on a second. Didn't you say how good Goldie was? Like, why are we saying John Eck is the best? I don't mean to stir anything up here, but I want to know your point of view on this. I, I think the one comment I saw on Twitter was the the most appropriate one, and it was, and I quote, he said the same thing about Goldie on TV. So <laughs> um, John Anik's excellent. Um, John Anik is not Mike Goldberg, and Mike Goldberg's not John Anik. And we live in a subjective world. Some people like ketchup, some people like mustard. See, here I am in, a, in, a, in an answer right now, Chris, to you that's so fucking politically correct that there's no way that Rogan would let me get away with it on the podcast. Well, uh, um, let me, can I think I it's up to the fans to make that judgment. And I, hey, I, my job discontinued. John Anik didn't push me out. He did nothing behind my back. There was... No ill will. We had a great relationship. I was a victim of budget cuts more than anything. I mean, the first interest payment was $170 million. I was let go at the same time as Chuck Liddell and Matt Hughes. 
does that make me feel good? Well, I guess it, I'm with a couple of Hall of Famers, but it still sucks. And there were 150 other employees at Zufa who didn't have their jobs. And I'm no more important than any of those people who gave everything they had to the Zufa product. So, hey, you know, over time, I guess people will have their opinions. There are some people who um, turned it down the volume when, when I was on back in the day, maybe tried to split the audio so they just listened to Joe. And they do the same now. So, yeah, it doesn't. It, it doesn't bother me. I mean, it, it yeah, it pisses me off. Um, it's, <laughs> no, it, I don't Come know. on, you tell know, me the okay. truth. You got to be honest with me here. When Joe said that, it had to rub you the wrong way. I mean, it had to have. I, how do, is it not? I mean, like, it, it felt like a stab in the back. I don't understand. Like, I'm not saying that he hates you or anything like that, but it was bizarre. Right. I thought it was odd. Yeah, I, and I don't know what the context was of, of the big picture of it. Um, and yeah, it kind of caught me off guard, like Goldie, like, but again, when somebody just, you know, had the comment of, you said the same thing about Goldie on TV, then I'm like, all right, well, you know, you, you can have Joe Montana and Tom Brady. And because Tom Brady went to that school up North then J.A. can be Brady. And he, I, I can't be Montana because I'm a Bengals fan and he beat us twice, but I'll, I'll be, <laughs> I'll be Peyton Manning and, and we're both pretty fucking good at what we do. So, Absolutely. um, yeah, I mean, yeah, of course I'm a competitive guy, uh, but I don't have any ill will towards John Anik. Uh, I don't have any ill will towards Joe Rogan. Um, you want to have an announce off? Let's fucking go. Let's drop the mics and, and here we go. And, uh, and I will guarantee you, it will be all over just like that. <laughs> Other than that, it's all good. I, John Anik's a, he's a great dude. He's a great family man. And um, yes, yes. Mike, you answered that beautifully. <laughs> I love the way you handled that. And I, I understand exactly what you're saying. You're, you're furious, but you've you got to take the politically correct approach. And I love that. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, it, I remember many times in my life, you know, my dad would always tell me that my mom told me something years ago that was very important. I'll share in a moment. But my dad would always say that if something happens in your career and you hit a bump, don't forget that everything that you say or do, the way you act and the way that you present yourself, all of a sudden becomes what package does the next person get? And so if I'm just kicking and screaming and being a little baby and taking my ball and going to the other court and you know, fuck you, fuck they did this. Then, then why would Scott Coker hire me at Bellator when things went bad at the UFC? I, and, and when they went to Showtime, there's nothing I could do then. Morrow was already full time there. there not, Coker called me and, it, it, and he apologized basically. Nothing I could do. But I've got to continue to be a good person and a human like you were kind enough to say early, Chris. And, and be someone who my kids can be proud of. And, and that's really what it comes down to. And I am, I'm, I'm presenting my package because I'm the product to the next employer. And, and you know, humbly the, the one that's fortunate enough to have me become their voice. Um, and it, it may very well be in boxing. I've already done Pro Box TV for a year with Paulie Malignaggi and I absolutely love it. I've learned a ton. Getting to work with a guy like Roy Jones Jr. is like, I mean, that's Superman. He's a Hall of Famer. It's just been incredible. So. That's the way I look at it. And the second thing is my mom said to me in Sarasota, Florida, this would have been about 1987. So all these people in the chat, none of you were born back then. I know that. <laughs> I get it. Dumb. And I know some of you are like, and some of them are saying my parents watched you. Some that I'm in the chat right now, Chris, are saying, oh, my grandpa loved you. Like, oh, fuck. I am old. As, I'm fucking old as dirt. But that said. My mom, an older lady came up when I was in Sarasota and, and during the highlights they used to say, and you can't kiss that baby goodbye. And we'd always do the White Sox baseball highlights because they had their spring training in Sarasota. So they were kind of our designated major league baseball team. Tampa didn't have a team at that point. I mean, I don't even know if we had color TV back then. I mean, I'm old. So I, I know I, my first cell phone had a big like picnic basket with it. I will say that it was 25 <laughs> seconds a minute. And if you went one minute and three seconds, you got charged another 25 seconds. And I would stare at that counter and hang up. Cause I was, I was right out of school and I was like poor, but my mom said, Sandra, you remember this, that people may meet you. You may meet one person. You may meet 10, you may meet a hundred, a thousand, a hundred thousand. You may meet a million, but they will all only meet you once. 
Yep. And the way that you treat them and the way that you act when they come up to you, regardless of what's going on around you, you had a bad show, you're in a fight with your wife, your your kids just pissed you off, you, you, you're you dealing with an illness in the family. They, I, I, I don't wanna say, Chris, that they, they don't care, but they don't know. Mm-hmm. And so the impression that I leave on each one of those people will be the impression they have for life. And if you're nice to them, they'll probably tell a dozen of their friends. And sure. if you're a dick, I'm pretty sure my mom said that. (laughs) She's Irish Catholic. Or if you're an asshole, they'll tell a thousand. And I've always just approached it that way. I've always approached every single fan. You know, sorry to bother you. I want to get a picture. Sorry to bother you. You fucking legend. Sorry to bother you. Sorry to bother me. Thank you for bothering me. Because if it weren't for you and people like you, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing right now. And I wouldn't be blessed to have all these memories and be talking about everything I've been able to do and looking forward to, you know, what is ahead for me. So uh, it's never been a bother, never been a bother. There was one time, I got all my teeth knocked out years ago in hockey, so I'm a dentist dream. She put on a whole, you know, second house on, you know, my my crowns and my bridges and this beautiful woman walks up to kind of like the barrier at a UFC. And, you know, we were doing pictures and stuff like that. She said, can I ask you a personal question? And I'm like, she was hot. I'm like, dude, I, Joe's fine with the show. You can ask me five personal questions. She goes, what kind of toothpaste do you use? Your teeth, they're so white. They're so like, oh. And she had a beautiful smile. Like, Chris, she was gorgeous. And I told her about hockey and that they were fake. And you would have thought I booted her dog in the ribs and broke three of them. She was crushed. <laughs> After, she thought I had the secret. She thought I had the secret recipe for the whitest of white, that I could go anywhere on the world and fix every tooth problem and make everybody, everybody, I don't want to, I was going to say a country or a state and then I stopped myself because I may want a job <laughs> in that country or state someday. So I stopped myself. I <laughs> uh, shouldn't stop myself from tweeting after that NFL game too. That was kind of fucking stupid. But that said, um, it was pretty funny. And I really did. I crushed her. And uh, man, if I weren't, so happy in my relationship now i'd love to look her up and apologize again but i have no idea where she is <laughs> I, you know i tell you first of all, of all the way you put you know how you treat people the way you put that all together is beautiful because i think about my pop my pop basically has told me the same type of thing i i've yeah. like when we started the show i would run up to luke thomas and ariel and i would i started a lot of trouble like i burned a lot of i had vox media sending messages out to ariel and luke and all the boys do not associate with the mma holes they're a bunch of assholes like just to get my name out there i i started like burning crazy bridges and then as i got older i had a kid my wife kind of you know she came on the show and tuned it down i started to learn holy i gotta i gotta pump the brakes i can't be doing stuff like this because you never know which person you're gonna piss off and then that's it it's over yep. it's all over yeah uh, <laughs> it, it's just like that and, and that is what you know my performance on that nfl game and 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 i own it i did not have a good game i over prepared and and it just wasn't a good day and i've done a lot of games i did nfl europe i did a lot of college I, you know i did cardinals preseason and but what got me taken off the game the next week that I would have done on Fox was that I got on Twitter and I told some dude to fuck off. And the reason I did is because my preparation was being questioned, not my performance, my preparation. And mm. I I was tired. I was aggravated. I was I was upset with myself and I should have never pressed that button. I, and I learned the hard way. Go a few years before that. One of my nights where I probably had the ugly cage fighter shirt on, ugly in Joe's mind, not Michael DeSabado, OH. Um, see how I did that as well? <laughs> and um, I'm at two in the morning and I'm reading some tweets. And I mean, at first, Twitter was awesome because, much like your chats, you felt like you were interacting with the fans and they would be, holy shit, Goldie answered my question. Mm-hmm. And then it got toxic behind a bunch of fake memes and fake names with three followers real quickly. And I was going off one night. I had one too many vodka Red Bulls and I was just motherfucking people. And my daughter calls and she must have been 14 or 15 at the time. And she goes, Dad, what are you doing? Oh, baby, what am I doing? Is your Twitter password the same? Yes, Kiara, it is. Okay. And that was it. She went and logged into my Twitter account and deleted about 
two dozen of my dumbass responses that were going to get me in big trouble. Um, cause I guess I thought I was bulletproof on social, like, like Dana can be in a good way. Um, and I'm not, and Kiara at 14 years old was smarter than her dad, but that's okay. That's, uh, that's what I leave when I'm not on this earth anymore, Kiara and Cole. So it, it's pretty funny though, that she was smart enough to call me out then. And it was simply dad is your password the same. She didn't tell me she was going to delete it all, Chris. Um, but she did a good job and I wish I would have talked to her, you know, before that box experience and that one, that one too many should have checked with Kira first. <laughs> I've gotten better. As you can see at this age, I've gotten better and I own it. I own it. I fucked up. Um, and a uh, hard lesson to learn, but, um, Hey, if you're not a human being, you're not living life and I'm a human being and I've never, I've never sold myself as being any better or any different than anybody else. I just happen to have been blessed with some really cool jobs. For some now, this NFL story I I didn't know about until right before I, I got to talk to you. I you know I only knew you from the UFC. I didn't know that you did all this other crazy stuff like the NHL, the NFL. And I, I stumbled upon a video that came up nine days ago of a guy just just lashing into you. And did yeah. this whole I, did you see this video about the uh, was the Lions the worst ever? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, and how I lasted one game and how bad broadcasters lasted longer than that. The, so <laughs> I couldn't when I watched this video, I was like, oh boy. Like I was like, what? I hope yeah. you didn't see this. So but like that is it's crazy. So you had this moment. So you're a, a an NFL fan. You get an opportunity. For those that don't know, like you, you get an opportunity of a lifetime here, right? You're calling what was it, the Vikings Lions? Was it? It was the Vikings Lions. And it was on short notice because I was on the schedule with Fox to do the Vikings Bills. And we were going to do the Vikings Lions as a rehearsal game. Man, I wish that would have stayed a rehearsal. All of a sudden, <laughs> something happened with CBS and Fox picked up an extra game. And I happened to be on that game. And we were the sixth crew. But, you know, things like the Olympics and the NFL are broadcasting dreams. I mean, mm, I sure. for, like I said, I went to NFL Europe four different times. I was ready and I knew the game. But I, I, I'm more in tune with the league now than I was then. More so because I was so busy with UFC after UFC after UFC and everything else I was doing. But I studied my ass off and I, I just congested my mind. And um, yeah, it, it, it pissed me off. My spotter is a dear friend of mine, but he, he didn't jive with my chart. Um, but at the end of the day, it came out of my mouth. And uh, so, so it's on me. The yeah. performance is on me. Nobody cares. Like I said before, nobody cares what's going on at the time. Um, I, I just did a couple of things. I mean, once in a while, it, I would like people to to have the balls to to step back and think, would they say that to me or you, Chris, to our face? Yeah. And, and not so much about the subjective part of what I do, because that just comes with the territory. But when you get into like, I hope your family die, like dumb, like, crazy. like cruel people, like, come on, bro. Yeah. Like you're hiding behind a like a little like skeleton face with one follower you just open this account and i'm going to block you but you got your word out so you can pick on me because you're jealous um like grow up like get out of your parents basement with your sticky fingers is what i used to say <laughs> that was one of them that kira deleted many times that particular <laughs> night by the way um as true as it may be with those certain people uh but haters are going to hate and uh it, it took me a while to be able to to get that because I'm I'm 58 years old, so I remember Rudy Martsky in the USA Today, and it was Fridays that he would have a little paragraph that would break down and critique the television production of the week, this mistake or that mistake. And that was kind of the way it was when I was growing up. You, you pleased your boss, you got a little direct feedback from your producer, and you didn't know if they loved it or hated you, but you came back and did the show again, you did the best you could, and you kept going. Well, now all of a sudden there was this instant response. And people wanted to micromanage like never before, especially because they were invested in the sport and they invested in the broadcast. Mm -hmm. So I, I always laugh that if my blooper reel in 250, let's say UFC, so times 10, so 3000 UFC fights, somewhere in that neighborhood, if my blooper reel is only 15 minutes wrong, 15 minutes long, you know, I'm pretty fucking good. If I were a major league baseball player, I'd have the first trillion dollar contract. Um, but yeah, they, they took a uh, took a book out of uh, Chuck's chapter or whatever the fuck I said that time or, or 
J- Matt Wyman, Wat Wyman. I mean, <laughs> I'm not a robot, man. I'm not a robot. Yeah, it's so but hard. At the time, it, it, yeah, it hurts. It hurts because you're just trying to do a good job. Um, and, and then I had to really sit back and kind of consider the source and understand that, you know, opinions are like assholes. Everybody has one. Some smell different than others. Some don't smell great, but everybody's entitled to their opinion, even if they're wrong. Mike, I really appreciate your honesty and the way you just candidly talk about this stuff because I know it's probably a pain in the ass to be answering these silly questions over here. So I do appreciate that. Um, there's one it, more. It's not, Chris. And I don't want to interrupt, but real quickly, it's not. So, but thank you very much. That means a lot. What you just said, it, it's not a pain in the ass. I, I appreciate you allowing me to be transparent. I wish. Uh, I hope more people say what you said early in this interview is that Goldie's human. He's just one of the dudes you'd sit at the end of the bar and have beers with. So please go on. But no, it's, it's not a pain in the ass, bro. It's, it's greatly appreciated and it means the world. But there's, there's one more question that always like anytime we, we said, Hey, we're having gold. Now I'm scared. <laughs> how do I, how do I dress this question up? No. <laughs> so, so the, the rumor was because of situations like the NFL, I'm not sure how the timeline was, but apparently Fox had enough. Is that the is that the reason for the demise of Mike Goldberg with the UFC, or is that all false? That is one hundred percent false. That's one thousand percent false. I did not get that next week's game in the NFL because of the backlash in the real media from the the mistakes I made on social media would have put me in a situation in Buffalo where. The world would have been hanging on my first mistake and the game would have been about me Mm -hmm. and people would have been watching Fox football that day to wait for me to fuck up again so that they could criticize it. And it wouldn't have been about the Vikings or the Bills. And that wasn't fair to Fox. It wasn't fair to the NFL. It wasn't fair to the players. And in a lot of ways, it wasn't fair to me. You know what? I did a UFC on Fox a week later, Eric Shanks, the president of Fox said, Goldie, that That was different. That was different. You're our guy. You're at the UFC. And if people look at my my ending with the UFC, at the end of the sale was also the end of the five-year deal with Fox. So I did all the Fox shows. And then WME came in, and all of a sudden, they were a member of the Disney family and on ESPN. So, no, there was... uh, there are no NFL games running up my ladder that I know of. Maybe maybe now there is, now that I've been more transparent with you, Chris. But no, A had nothing to do with B. And um, I did a, a bunch of UFCs on Fox and all the Fox programming for a great amount of time afterwards. So no, that had no effect at all. There we go. And, and Especially finally, with Joe, because he doesn't like any other sports. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> finally, we put that to rest, because a lot of people are talking about that. And, and another thing people keep on saying is, well, Joe wanted him gone. That seems crazy to me. But is, is there any truth to that? I, not that I know of. I, I, you know, I spent a lot of time telling you how he would always be honest with me and tell me what was the truth in his mind. That dude had as much as many tears as I did that night, man. Mm. It was it was like you were losing your best friend. Mm. And that's how it felt. It's how it felt with Bruce. It's how it felt with Niner, our stage manager. It's it's how it felt with Anthony Giordano. Um it, it, we were all in a room afterwards for an hour and there were tears and there were as many with Joe as there were with me. So no, not that I know of. Um I Joe even said that he tried to talk to William Morris and figure out what was going on and why this was happening. And I mean, this was the same guy who made sure I didn't go to the WWE Mm -hmm. a a couple of years prior, like made sure that that didn't happen because he wanted me sitting next to him. This one was out of his hands. And he has said that he said that in a quote, it's out of my hands. I don't know what they're doing. I tried. I wanted to do a tribute. They didn't want to do one. I don't know what the fuck's going on. I, I'm friends with Dana. I don't know anybody else at the time with William Morris. So um, not not in any form or fashion that I know of. And it never did Joe ever say anything. And we've had social times together since my departure. And they've been a blast. And so if that were the case, Joe's not a phone dude he had me up in his dressing room after the comedy show in phoenix when i was now the bellator guy and i would 
have not had the laughs with him. And he was complimentary of me going to Bellator and vocally very happy for me and said, Bellator is very lucky to have Mike Goldberg. He's great at what he does. Um, maybe I was the best in his mind at that point, you know, <laughs> but um, no, Joe's always been a supporter. So um, I would find that very hard to believe. And there's, there's never been one ounce of any, I don't want to say evidence, but any kind of article or anything that would make me think otherwise. And if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. But I, I, I put my head on the pillow knowing I had a great partner and a lifelong friend. So that's it, how I feel about it. It's kind of amazing, the, the UFC career, going into Bellator, then going over to, well, I mean, BYB. It's wild how you've had a chance to experience all these different types of um, uh, events and, and uh, now into boxing over there. I mean, when you look back, you're going to be like, I mean, I couldn't even imagine like the stories that you can tell now. Oh. I mean, that's got to be a beautiful thing, right? It, it, it really is, and it's, it's, it's a huge blessing, and yourself included a lot of people don't know that um i was the sideline reporter for the chicago bulls from 1988 to 1993 and i watched michael jordan every single night you wow. talk about your rangers i'll tell you about the knicks i'll tell you about starks slammed over michael i'll tell you about patrick ewing never missing from the baseline i'll tell you about oak going crazy i'll tell you about the bad boys and i'll tell you about michael getting shit in atlantic city because he went with his father and the bulls were down in that series and i lived it if you go to the last dance you look at the first seven episodes i lived every single one of those and this was all pre-ufc then i'm doing the nhl crazy. on the network I called the last goal ever scored against Patrick Watt. It was scored by Andrew Brunette of the Minnesota Wild. Yeah, man. I mean, that's yeah. wild. You know, it, I, I'm such a competitive guy that I always, I always want to know what's next, and I always want to compete to be the best in the world again. And, and boxing may be that forum where I can go on my next journey and perhaps become a soundtrack for another promotion that becomes the, the next big thing like the UFC has in MMA, Chris. But when I sit back and think about it at times, like Michael Jeffrey Jordan, like, man. And, and, I, and I remember we were doing the pregame and I would never ask Michael for interviews when we would do pregame on Sports Channel because everybody wanted to talk to Mike every game and I'm covering every game. So I'd always go to John Paxson and Pax would joke with me, you know, another good kid from Ohio. Pax would go, do you ask Michael? No, I, I was scared. You asked Scotty? Scotty said no. What about Horace? Well, Scotty told Horace to say no. And if you know that relationship, you'll get the joke. And he goes, well, why don't you ever talk to Bill Cartwright? And I'd always go to Pax, I'd be like, my arm. And then, and then he spits. And by the time it gets to me, it's like, it's like a waterfall. And Pax would laugh. And he's a well-spoken you know, point guard who hit the big shot against the Phoenix Suns in 93 in game six. And I was there. Now I live in Phoenix, as you do. Um, but Pax would always give me shit, and then he'd give me a great interview. But he would always say, yes, no, I'm not going to ask Michael. Oh, I'm scared. I don't want to bother Michael. But after that Atlantic City trip, that's cool. I stood in the masses of people, and everybody was all over Mike. Charles had just been named the MVP. The Bulls were down to the Knicks. Why would you go to Atlantic City? Why this and that? Why are you with your dad? Blah, 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 blah. And Mike, you talk about answering the same question all the time. This was when if the cameras and the mic weren't in front of Michael, they didn't get what they needed. So, And then I just waited and waited. And I said, hey, Mike, can I have a moment? I don't even remember what I asked, Chris. But Michael Jordan gave me an interview that was truly a gift and an acknowledgement of how I always respected him and respected his space through 82 games a season for multiple seasons. And I remember putting that up on the satellite and sending it back to Sports Channel. And I mean, I, they wanted to sign me to a lifetime deal. I was gonna wow. be signed till I was 100 years old. But I didn't do anything other than respect Michael over the years. And he gave me this honest, transparent answer to questions I didn't even ask. But everybody was asking, and Mike knew that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that he did it for me, and he kind of smiled when he walked away. And I knew what he had done. It was, it was very cool. And then fast forward, I went to ESPN when Mike was playing baseball. 
was still living in Chicago and I went in the locker room afterwards uh, when Michael came back and I was at ESPN. Ron Harper was a bull. I went to college with Ron Harper all four years at Miami of Ohio and Pax. And, you know, a lot of guys were still there. I think Steve Kerr probably was the Pax at that point. But, um, you know, there were there were many of the same people there. And Mike was one of them. And uh, Michael, he said, Goalie, what are you doing now? And I said, I'm doing play by play for ESPN. Michael Jordan, and I quote, I always knew you were too good for that sideline stuff. That's awesome, Goldie. Kick ass, man. Like, and I was just like, wow. Wow. I, I, I would feel like Wolf of Wall Street. Like, I, if I, I would have been smart, kind of with Joe, tell me how you choke somebody out by Kimura. You're the black belt. I would have said to Michael, hold on. Could you say that again? <laughs> but just a little bit slower and more clearly because, oh my God, like I was, I, I'm on cloud nine just sharing it with you right now. That's amazing. Michael Jordan. That's what? amazing. Yeah, I, I got to ask you this. I, so it's funny, like I, I grew up in New York, but I have a lot of family in Michigan and I'm a Pistons fan, believe it or not. I hated the Knicks as a kid. I was a massive Pistons fan, but they had such history with the, the Bulls, the bad boys and the Bulls. So were you working when the bad boys were doing their thing? Absolutely. Oh, I my God. Every one of those games. Can you every give, one of those things. So there, I mean, Jordan wow. and the Pistons back in the day were like, that was that was mean stuff going on. Uh, can, is there it's any sad. stories that stand out? I mean, it's the story that everybody talks about. And it's the Pistons walking off the court and not shaking hands. And the fact that there was a lot of respect between Isaiah and Michael before then. And obviously, Isaiah had a tighter relationship with Magic. Um, and, you know, the Pistons had to overcome the big bad Celtics in the East to then get their two titles. Then you know, Michael had to get by the Pistons to get his titles. Um, but I, I, I'll never forget that attitude in Isaiah and the Pistons just walking off the court and showing no respect yeah. to the Bulls after they, 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 they already had two rings. They had a ring on each finger. And then the Bulls, you know, they, they didn't have theirs yet, but they at least had the Eastern Conference wrapped up when they won that series in 1991. And, like, I remember the angst in the locker room and the disrespect. And I'm a hockey player, like we talked about really early. And in hockey in the playoffs, you go a seven-game series and you beat the living shit out of each other. You cross-check people in the kidney and the liver. You you give them a high stick. You like up in the crotch area. You like you do anything. Like you cross-check somebody in the face. You're trying to win the sports greatest sports greatest trophy is a Stanley Cup. Agreed. I'm sorry, I'm biased, but it is the hardest trophy to win. Hundred percent. So you're battling for seven games, and what do you do at the end of a playoff series? You shake hands. You shake hands. Handshakes, that's the best thing about the National Hockey League. Now, in youth hockey, we shake hands every game. In the NHL, they don't not shake hands every game for disrespect. It's just 82 games, a lot of shaking hands. But it's a ceremony, as you know, Chris, being an NHL fan as well. You shake hands. The Devils and the Rangers shook hands after Messier said, we're going to fucking win this series, and they go on to win the 94 Cup. They shook hands. They didn't like each other very much, but they shook hands. Yep. And Ken Danico went down that line and he didn't walk away like Isaiah. That's what I remember. And that is why, as many people know, and it's not, I'm not like the insider here. That is why when the dream team became the dream team, you know, that Indiana Hoosier, who was a pretty damn good basketball player, wasn't part of it. And that stuck in Michael's mind. And is that an obvious story to remember? Yes. Hmm. But. That's the one I remember. And well, I do remember those great games in New York at Madison Square Garden because those were intense. Yeah. And, uh, man, and 93 finals. I, if Pax doesn't hit that shot, Charles had, I mean, the Suns were loaded, loaded. They had Thunder Dan, another good mid American conference guy like Harp. And Harp wasn't a bull yet. He was, he was still probably a clipper at that point. Um, and I remember thinking as I was covering that game, like it, it's because six and seven were going to be in Phoenix, that the Bulls are not going to win if it goes to a game seven and Pax hits the shot. And that was that. And there was there was Michael's third. So, um, yeah, great memories. And, and just being around a guy like that and seeing how he was and the way he treated people, the way he never showed up to a post fight interview in a T-shirt or without a shirt or. He was always suited up, man. He was he just 
He's Michael Jeffrey Jordan, man. He's one of a kind. He's the greatest of all time. Is wild. And you said you you called hockey, right? You were the NHL. You did a little bit. So how long did you do that it, for? I did th- I did two and a half years at ESPN, which is how I met Bruce Connell, okay. which got me into crazy guys at the time. No girls yet, but guys in their underwear in a cage in Japan. <laughs> if I don't do the NHL on ESPN too. I don't meet Brucey, and we're not having this conversation. So. Um, I mean, it was a dream come true for me. I'd done college hockey. I played college hockey. I played from age five. My brother played. Um, my son played. I, my son was the captain many years, leading scorer, went to nationals. I'm a level five wow. USA hockey coach. I mean, hockey's my life. I, my hockey jerseys aren't as prominently displayed here because we talk more combat, but I got my Joe Thornton right there. I got my 92 Olympic jersey signed by every single player right there. I, I, I've, got, I've got it. I got my <laughs> sure with Rizzo. I, I got it all, man. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's crazy the, the things that I've been able to experience in, in hockey and the things my son has because of the kindness. And I met Joe Thornton because he's a huge combat sports guy. Brent Burns is a brown belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He's now in Carolina as a hurricane. Burns, he was a rookie in Minnesota when I was leaving to become full-time at the UFC. Um, that was that's my that's my gig. I mean, calling the revenge fight between Darren McCarty and Claude Lemieux is one that goes down in Red Wing history. I was their broadcaster when they won their first cup in 42 years. Like I mentioned, I called the last goal against Patrick Waugh. The Minnesota Wild oh, in no. 2003 are still the only team in NHL history to come back from a 3-1 series deficit twice in the same playoffs. There's been three O's, but twice. We were down 3-1 to Colorado, then we were down 3-1 to Vancouver, and ended up getting swept by Anaheim, and then Anaheim played the New Jersey Devils, and that was the famous Scott Stevens on Paul Correa in oh uh, the first game of that Stanley Cup. Correa scored in overtime. And, you bring back so many memories. Was, this is crazy. I feel like oh, I'm a, man, that, <laughs> I feel yeah, like I'm a kid again. <laughs> It's, I'm sorry. I feel like a kid again listening to these 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 hockey yeah. stories, and this is why. Do you think hockey is the toughest sport to do play by play for? What what would be the toughest sport to do? Well, <laughs> obviously the NFL for me. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that was a stupid. Fuck, I mean, like you know, no, I, 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 I'd love another swing, man. And I and I, should, if I would have had that game the week afterwards, I would have nailed it because I got all I got I got all the the tweaks with my, my board and, and everything on my chart. And I, I had it all figured out, but I, I messed it up that I couldn't do it again. Mm. For me, hockey was easy to call because I grew up playing hockey. Okay. So where a lot of people would say the names are crazy and they are, I called the Russian five, um, which was a blessing in itself. I mean, Igor Larionov, uh, Slava Kozlov, Sergei Fedorov, uh, Vladimir Konstantinov before the car accident, obviously after the Red Wings won the cup, and Papa Bear, uh, you know, Slava Fetisov. And like Fetisov to Larion, up to Kozlov, back to the corner, Kozlov gets it up the point, Fedorov shoots, score! Red Wings lead one nothing. I did a game where Sergei Fedorov scored all five goals against the Washington Capitals, and they beat the Caps 5-4 in overtime. And it was on December 26th. It was before the league mandated that you had to have like the 23rd and the 26th off. It was just, okay, 24th, 25th. So none of us wanted to go to, the, it's, I mean, you go to the Joe to call hockey, it's a pretty cool gig, but it, I mean, it's Christmas. We didn't want to go to the rink on December 26th. And all of a sudden, Sergey won goal, two goals. Now it's going to overtime. He scores again. Like, wow, that was incredible. So for me, it was not, and I'm sorry, that was my hockey. I'm getting excited about hockey. That was a long-winded answer. Chris. I love I apologize. it. Uh, my, it, fans, it was, my fans fell was, asleep, but I love it. <laughs> my coach, my coach, uh, Ian Cushman, may he rest in peace, was on the 1958 Montreal Canadian Stanley Cup team. Nose looked like the motherfucking Mississippi River. And, uh, man, nobody ever asked, no parent ever asked Ian about ice time for their kid. Because you, like, <laughs> you think I was, I, I wasn't really afraid to ask Michael for an interview, but the no parent did to coach Cushman, what they would do to a coach Goldberg years later. Like, why is my kid not playing? I don't know. I just handle the forwards. Nobody would do that to crash. And uh, that man is truly my hero. And he was, a, he would always say, Chris, he would say, I was the end of a bench. I was the end of the bench guy. Mm-hmm. And I'd be like, crash. Like, 
and he was hard on us, man. There's like, I always say you either got screamed at, yelled at, or, you know, had pucks thrown at you. Like he'd shoot pucks at our head. Like it was, yeah, there was, there was no, there's no hugs and kisses. There's no way you don't coach like you do today. He didn't give a shit. He'd like get it right or get off the ice. Um, goddamn prima donna's whole damn lot of you. That was his line. And, um, I was one of the better players. And so he was on my ass all the time. And he happened to be my neighbor and his son's like a big brother who was my babysitter. So the fact that he loves me, the greatest thing that ever happened to me in my life. But man, like I said, you either got yelled at, screamed at or scolded. I mean, that was the only way you heard from coach until afterwards when you realized that he really was a teddy bear, but into the bench, there were six teams. I get it. The Europeans weren't over here yet. There were six teams in North America crash. Let's say there are 20 man roster. There's 120. All right, let's make it a little more. Let's say there's 140 people playing in the NHL back in the 50s and the 60s. He told a story. Actually, a story was told to us at Coach Cushion's Celebration of Life that he was in the corner in a game against Gordy Howe. And Gordy said to Ian, and, and Ian ended up playing in Chicago, played for the Rangers, uh, played for the Canadians. I mean, there's only three others that he didn't at that point. <laughs> um, and Gordy was like, hey, Crash, you think? You're pretty, you're pretty big guy, you're pretty tough guy. He's like, you, you know, you don't have to worry about dropping with Lee tonight. We're okay. <laughs> Holy shit! Like, Gordy, how? Like, wow. Think about it. Gordy said, "Yeah, you, you big boy, you big boy. We're good, we're good. Just so you know." Now I'm sure Gordy slashed, you know, coach at the next, you know, face off, and coach cross checked him in front of the net. But you know, just to hear that about a guy who you absolutely admire and consider your hero, and then they're talking about Gordy Howe. That's insane. That's insane. Gordy Howe. Like just thinking about that name gives me chills. That is wild. I know I have, I got to send this stream to my cousins in Michigan. They are massive Red Wing fans. They tried to pull me over to the Red Wings as a kid and Ah. hearing the stories from you. I kind of wish I did as a kid. They were such a good team back in the day. But um, this is, this is fascinating. It's crazy because I, I got the job and the first thing that happened is there was a celebrity golf tournament. And I had just flown into Detroit to get ready to move from Chicago to become the voice of the Red Wings. And I go to this tournament, and as I'm getting my clubs out of the car, I'd driven from Chicago. My family hadn't come up yet. This nice ass Cadillac pulls up next to me. And out is this, you know, beautiful older woman, Colleen Howe. And then out of the passenger side, fucking Gordy Howe. Like, holy <laughs> shit. And I, and I watched Gordy when I was little, little, little at the Olympia. I mean, we lived in Detroit for five years, and that's where I started playing hockey, was in Southfield, Michigan. I wouldn't, you know, Coach Erickson is from there. He's my other hero as a coach, and he got me started. My dad wasn't, dad and mom weren't really hockey people, but he's like, your kid should try this. Hmm. And I did, and I played for Coach Erickson and Coach Cushing my entire life in Cleveland. But out comes Gordy, and he's just the gentlest and the gentlest of gentlemen, and he's Gordy Howe. And Hey, how are you? Like, I, Mike Goldberg, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, Dave Strader went to ESPN and I'm the new voice of the Red Wings. And he said, wow, that, that's awesome. Congratulations. Welcome to the family. Like, oh, okay. Did that beat the Michael thing? I don't know, but I was gorgeous. So I was pretty darn close. They're pretty awesome. That is awesome. Damn, man. Dude, I can do a whole separate show talking to you about football, hockey, all this other stuff as well. It's fascinating to hear your stories. By the way, your bangles, not so bad this year. They're doing pretty good. What do you say? I, not so bad at all. I was I was a little worried at first with the 0-2. Now you can make the argument they could be 13 and 1. The only time the Bengals were blown out this season was Monday night in Cleveland, which is tough for me because my dad was born and raised in Cincinnati. So I spent my high school years in Cleveland, but I am not a Browns fan. I am a Bengal. I am a Cincinnati kid, Skyline Chili, Montgomery and Ribs, La Rosa's Pizza. Grandma's from there. It's Cincinnati. Is what my grandma Betsy used to say. I, I am a, I was there. Super Bowl 16. I'm a junior in high school. I'm with my dad. And we're watching the game and we lose to Joe Montana. Super Bowl 23. I'm in Miami. My first ever satellite live shot. I was at Channel 40 in Sarasota. Boomer's my guy. We lose to Joe Montana. <laughs> I'm a Bengal. And so I was a little concerned at first, uh, you know, with the 0 2 start and the math and then the schedule. But the win at Tennessee. And then the win over the Chiefs, I went, okay, all right, we're going to be all right. That Steelers game was just, like, nonsense. And really at 0-2, week three, my son's a Jets fan. 
we go on a father son trip and it was awesome until halftime when the Bengals were winning. Then Cole got grumpy. I'm like, dude, I, I would be grumpy too, but it, this is still father son trip, bro. Like that said, I would have been grumpy. So I, I gave him a little, I gave him a little slack on that one, but yeah, they're, they're looking good. Six straight who day. Um, I was a little worried in the first half against the Buccaneers because the schedule, you have the Patriots on Saturday, but then you finish with Buffalo on Monday night. And then what will probably be for the for the AFC North against Baltimore in the final week of the regular season. Um, so the Bengals have put themselves in a great position and it's exciting to be a Bengals fan again because yeah. there've been a lot of droughts and uh, saw Joe Montana, another one for you, Chris, saw Joe Montana in an elevator um, at, a, at a UFC event. He, I don't know if he was there for the event, but I happened to see him and I shook his hand and just said what a class act he was and how much I admired him. And I said, I will tell you though, Joe, you broke my heart twice. And he just looked at me and he goes, and I go, I'm a Bengals fan. And he smiled and he said, and I quote, well, I'm not going to apologize, you know. <laughs> and I was like, fucking A-rights. I am like, in that, Joe, is why you are great. And that is why I admire you so much. But with the, like, big ass smile on his face. But he told me, he, he was like, like I talked about Joe Big John. He wasn't going to tell me what I wanted to hear. He said straight up, I am not going to apologize. And I'm like, nor would I expect you to, Joe. Nor would I expect you to. Man, you have done and seen it all. It's 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 so yeah. wild hearing these stories coming out of your mouth. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, the highest of highs. Uh, your career, your well, life. And, and I credit you. Your 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 interview and your skills, your voice, everything. I, I and I'm not blowing sunshine up your ass, bro. You're good at what you do. And Mo spoke so highly of you and your better half and the popularity and how much fun you have and the graphics and, and everything, Chris. So you've, you've, you've got me in this great mood today on a day that's bittersweet because I'm not with the UFC anymore. Um, and I loved that job and I'm not able to hang with my dad, you know, as of five years ago today. And, uh, you've put a huge fucking smile on my face. So credit goes to you too. It's a two way street. You've been able to open up this fun time and allowed me to share these stories with you and, everybody who's watching and listening. And so I thank you very much for that. I, I needed it. I needed it. So thank you. That means that means the world to me. I, I appreciate that. By the way, I see the big guy in the chat right now. Big Mo is in the chat as we speak. Oh, so shout out to all big Mo. six, seven of Big Mo. <laughs> I want you to raise your glass high and give wild. <laughs> Woohoo! That was a pretty good big mo right there. Oh, Look at that. Not bad at all. Not bad at all. That uh man, I I see so much of me in Mo. And I mean that in the like the biggest compliment. Oh, look at you. See, and your production's fucking awesome. <laughs> and I'm not that short. I'm sorry. And I'm way taller than Claudia and Polly. And we're all way shorter than Mo. And <laughs> I'm just—he's just such a good guy. He's—he's he's built like I am. He wants to be the best at what he does, and he had the sunglasses going early. And I, you know, I'm checking out. I'm keeping his game. I'm like, this guy's good. He's tall. He's got a thing. But like Corey Hart, like, why the fuck are you wearing sunglasses at night? Like, what's the deal? So we're out in dinner. We're, we're out in dinner uh, in Biloxi, Mississippi, BYB. And my wife, Fernanda, she's like, I'm going to ask him about the glasses. And I'm like, okay. And we were just getting to know each other. And she said, what about the glasses? And he said, well, I'm trying to do something to, to stand out. And I'm trying to be distinct. I want to have like, you know, a vibe. I want people to, and I go, dude, you're fucking six, seven. How tall are you? Six, seven. You're fucking six, seven. You don't need glasses. So Mo, and I'm so proud of him for this. He gets the gig at Boxer. He's doing, he did Clarissa Shields, Savannah Marshall. I was at that fight because we had a BYB the next night. He absolutely killed it. Chris Billum Smith just had a fight in Bournemouth, which is his hometown in the UK. And Mo's just crushing the fucking intros, crushing them. And I, 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 he reminds me of the drive that I had back then. And I still have, which is why we get along and why he said, you got to go on this show with these guys. And they're in Phoenix. They're in your backyard. And... Um, the next BYB, he comes in and he looks, he looks at Fernando and he goes, so boxer and sky sports told me to lose the sunglasses <laughs> and they both just kind of had a little chuckle. It wasn't an, I told you so or anything, 
But he just had the, the biggest fucking grin on his face telling Fernanda kind of like, hey, you were right. Yeah, you were right. So no more sunglasses. <laughs> and and he and I, we had a, we just had a come to Jesus moment with with everything that the night that he texted you about being on the show and just the way that he's approaching things in the modern day of social media and different things. And um, he just shows me so much respect and regard, but he's my friend, a colleague, yes, but he's my friend and, and I got his back and he's got mine. And, and, it, and you might think, why does a 27 year old, six, seven dude who's, you know, you know, wet behind the ears as Mr. Miyagi would say, <laughs> why, why do I need him to have my back? Because good people help good people. And, uh, Cody, Big Mo, is a, is a fucking great person. And uh, I think he and I are going to be doing a lot of stuff together. I'm saying some prayers, but I think we're going to be doing a lot of stuff together. BYB is growing, and uh, I, I love the guy. I love the guy. He's great at what he does. And uh, there will come a day, and Buff will always have his spot, as will Michael, as will all the great announcers that have come through, Jimmy Lennon Sr., Jimmy Lennon Jr., but – but you trust me, in, in three, four more years, there won't be anybody on this planet who doesn't know who Big Mo is and, and recognizes him for his talents, his charisma, his delivery. And if you get to know him away from it all, he's a pretty fucking cool guy, too. So he's, he's become my... Uh, very tall little brother very quick. <laughs> I, I, you said it perfectly. The guy, he has it. It's it's wild, man. It's uh, no pun intended, but uh, yeah, it, he's got that it factor for sure. <laughs> you know, I had to slip that in. I mean, and that's why we like we're like, we're like why what, what's with the sunglasses? Like you know, but he's he's smart. He understands marketing. I mean, played college football. I, I want to say I don't know if it was his master's, but he also got a degree in business administration. So he thinks out of the box a lot, a lot like Bruce Buffer has over the years. I mean, people who truly know the whole story of Bruce know that Bruce is the brains and the marketing mind of let's get ready to rumble and all the video games. And like Michael was the voice, but Bruce was the brains mm -hmm. and he was the marketing and he made that explode. And then Michael did UFCs back in the day. He couldn't do one. Bruce said, hey, I'll give it a try. And now, you know, you can make the argument that Bruce has surpassed Michael. It doesn't it doesn't matter in the big picture. They're both great at what they do. But uh, the whole world knows who Bruce Buffer is, and they know when it's time, it's time, and they know that's Buff. I've seen 20,000 people in Japan say it's time, the same, the same moment as Bruce does. And, and Mo thinks in that same way. He thinks out of the box, and he thinks as a businessman, but he also really works hard to perfect his craft. And I've said things to him about some of the early things he was doing and you know he liked the ideas and thank you for the feedback and you know maybe i won't be as coarse uh a piece of sandpaper as maybe i felt joe was over the, the years uh but at the end of the day a true friend tells a true friend things that are going to make them better and i, I will always do that for mo and i'll be quite honest he might be 30 years younger than me but he's already done it a number of times to me and I absolutely thank him from the bottom of my heart. And if he isn't Venmoing me right fucking now, the money that, I'm <laughs> that we just gave him, then you and I are on the next plane to Colorado and we'll hunt him down. He can look down on with his sunglasses and beat the shit out of him. <laughs> I was going to say, we're going to need more people than just you and me. We're going to need an army <laughs> to take him down. <laughs> first and foremost <laughs> we'll bring step and group with us we'll bring we'll bring the skyscraper as our backup <laughs> oh my god I, I i got a gazillion questions more but i'm not going to ask those questions if you have a second we have some alerts that came in and maybe some questions from the chat How, what do you say about that without these people for us it's like we've talked about chris uh during this whole uh this whole moment of sharing together and the first of many, because I'm coming to do, I'm coming to do one of your UFCs with you. If you will allow me the honor and the, and the pleasure of doing that, because that would be a trip Mike. Um, to be able to do your version. That would, man, that would be insane. And I can tell that we have chemistry, so we're good to go. Um, so yeah, throw, throw them at me and uh, let's go. Let's talk to the fans, bud. Let me just say this right now because I didn't. I touched on this on our gaming channel. It's a small, intimate gaming channel, but I didn't say it on the main channel here. So can we make an announcement here and say possibly in the future? Actually, not fuck possibly in in the near future. 
Fight Buddies on the MMA holes. Mike Goldberg in the building. What do you say? Absolutely 100% yes. Here we go. Done. Let's go. Wonderful. Whoa. I love it. I got chills right there. I think the audience is, they're expl the internet's going to explode. I, so. I can't wait to do this. All right, Mike, here we go. I'm going to play some alerts over here. Uh, let's see what the okay. people have to say. Uh, get ready for some cringiness. Let's see. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Okay, this is from Wildberry. Why does Joe Rogan like goat vagina? Okay, the question is, why does Joe Rogan like goat vagina? Because Joe, <laughs> fuck, you know, Joe eats a lot of deer and, and he, he likes very lean meats. And uh, Marvin Eastman, that was a nasty cut. That is not the way I would describe it, but I would say maybe it goes along with the fact that he likes to hunt his own food and have elk and deer and some lean meat and barbecue it himself in the backyard, maybe on a Traeger. And uh, maybe there was a goat in his life that uh, was attractive back in the day. That That's all I know. Um, I also know that when Joe said that, I probably immediately said on the air right afterwards, that was Joe Rogan who just said that. Okay, there we go. See, we got the answer. Thank you for the answer here. We got, oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. Spank away, spank away. It's Ariel Hawani. Oh my God, he's beating the meat. Hold on. <laughs> oh my God. Wait, wait, hold on a second. Did it go? It's still going. Oh my God. I can't believe this. You gotta be your meat. I don't know. Dana White doesn't like I don't know what that was. Hold on. This is from Ninja Choke. Love you, Goldie. We have to ask here at the MMA Holes always one question. How's the good doggy? We gotta know. P.S. You belong in the Hoffman. Thank you for so many great calls, bro. So. <laughs> wow. That's a brilliant accent. I did a little bit like Michael Bisping after three drinks. I didn't catch all of it, though. Okay, so basically... But um, I got the Hoff, Hall of Fame. Yes, he wants you and he thinks you deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. And I think that jacket's eventually going to be on you. What do you think? Um, it would be an absolute honor. Um, being there when, when Brucey e was inducted posthumously um, and his son Tyler, I mean, their family, I stay with them all the time when we'd have shows out east. Um, like I said, I lived with Bruce. And, and when he was inducted after... The, the way too early passing into the UFC Hall of Fame. It was it was a precious moment that I was able to be part of. I remember sitting out by the pool at the Four Seasons uh, that afternoon, kind of helping Tyler finalize his speech uh, for his father, who they had just lost, and he was put into the Hall of Fame. Um, it would be an absolute honor. But to be quite honest with you, interviews like we're doing right now, Things that people say to me in public, um, you're fucking legend. That's my Hall of Fame, Chris. So I don't need a jacket. It would be very cool to have one. But at the end of the day, Hall of Fame, no Hall of Fame. If people believe that I was the soundtrack and they love me for what I did, good, bad, and indifferent, you're my Hall of Fame. Every single one of you is my Hall of Fame. So do I hope? Yes. And hey, Anik usually MCs though, so won't that be a great moment <laughs> if it does happen? Um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I I would say that Joe and I would have done work worthy of of that honor. Um, but like I said, the the Hall of Fame is is really about what I've given to the fighters and the fans, and uh, I know in my heart that I've given them everything I have, and I'll continue to do so until I'm done broadcasting. And I'll just be a nice guy who's really shitty at men's league now because I'm getting old and slow. <laughs> there was another part of that question. I'm going to slide it in real quick. I think they want to know if you're packing some heat. They talked about your girth. Are you have a big Johnson or what? Um, I am the little acorn <laughs> that becomes the little bit bigger acorn. <laughs> and I'll tell you what. 
when I get in the mood, you better buckle up, woman, because 60 seconds of thunder is coming your way, and we'll get a full 10 hours sleep. I, I asked Bruce this, Bruce Buffer. I asked him. Oh, Bruce probably told you he was. <laughs> I, like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, man, Holmes. Man, I, 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 like. I asked him if he yells, it's time, before he's about to nut. That's what I asked Bruce Buffer. I'm going to ask you, before you have sexual experiences, do you go, here we go, or it's all over after you're complete? Does that happen? Um, uh, here we go, yeah, yeah. And then quite often, it's, you know, maybe it's Conor McGregor, Jose Aldo, and it's not me saying it's all over. My wife going, it's all over, just like that? <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, was it good for you? <laughs> yeah, it was good. yeah, great, you know. I'll be in the other room for a couple hours, and, you know, when do you go on the road again? <laughs> uh, no, but I have had people say that I should do weddings, and at a wedding, I might say, here we go, or I might also say it's all over, depending on the relationship. Uh, but I've also had people ask me uh, online to, uh, would I be there at their funeral and say it's all over? I'm like, oh, man, maybe at your divorce, but that's, you know, that's crazy. Um, but I guess you could say, you know, <laughs> oh, do I say this or not? You know, why does every bride smile when she walks down the aisle? No more blowjobs in the diet ends tonight. I mean, you know, you, I, I, I know some of those funny lines. So, yeah, I guess I could say at some weddings, here we go, and it's all over uh, at the same time to, to some of the grooms. But all kidding aside, uh, my first relationship with two beautiful kids, great years, have a great wife now, um, and I'm packing that huge acorn, baby. <laughs> that thunder's coming, baby. It's like a hockey ship, man. You know, I got to change on the fly, but I'm going to get back on the ice right afterwards. There you go. See, like a true true celebrity over there answering the questions, how we <laughs> like it over here. I love it. Uh, we have a couple more alerts here. We'll try to <laughs> speed this up. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. This is from Ninja Choke. Paul Felder is a bumbling fucking numbskull. We want Goldie back. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's wrong, to be honest, because you're it's different jobs. No, am I wrong on this? Yes. Oh, you're 100% correct. There's people who say they want me and Anik together. Okay, I, that'd be cool. We could do it. But, like, do you take the first round? I take the second round. Do you do the first part of the tail of the tape? I do the second. Um, they're different jobs. They're, they're different jobs. It's subjective. Um, and a lot of people think I'm a babbling idiot as well. And, you know, so that's okay. Um, I, you know, it is what it is, but we don't have the same job. So I think more so than anything, we, we don't have the same job. And so I can't replace Paul and Paul can't replace me. But if the UFC wants to make a move in other directions, other positions, you know, it, it's not high school football. I can't play both ways. I can't play on both sides of the ball. So I'll be on offense, Paul will be on defense. And if they need another cornerback, then they'll, they'll go ahead and replace Paul. And if they want a quarterback, they can get me. That's corner, quarter. See, I do know something about football. <laughs> well, I am not going to subject you to any more of this nonsense. You have been a... All I know is we, got, we, went, we went from goat's vagina to packing heat. I mean, that's... That, that I'm going to... That I'm going to have to, like, get out of my, like, head tonight. All this happiness I just shared with you, Chris. I got to, like, take that and just delete, delete. Deny, 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 delete. <laughs> Get it about an hour. <laughs> is this the weirdest interview you've ever had? I mean, you've had, I'm sure, a million the interviews. The last 10 minutes have been. The last 10 <laughs> minutes have been. For, for, for sure it is. The last 10 minutes, shit's gone downhill quickly. Uh, but it sounds like a lot of the conversations that I had with Joe over the years. Uh, when we weren't on the microphone or in the, when we were in the middle of Brazil or England or Canada or <laughs> Abu Dhabi. I mean, it's... Just sounds like the boys in the locker room, so I can handle it, and it's it's awesome. And uh, hey, if, if, if people don't want to hear the answer, don't ask the question. So yeah, it's 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 gotten a little fucking weird. The ghost <laughs> vagina. Thing that, <laughs> that kind of caught me. I don't, why, I don't know why does like I don't know why that would be the 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 private part of a female animal in which Joe would refer to. Like why go? I mean, I get the other half because the cut was nasty, but but why it go? And did Joe look at pictures or images of that in his prior experiences? 
nights, maybe late at night on the road when he was doing small comedy shows in Uncasville, Connecticut at the Mohegan Sun. I, now I'm just, now I'm going downhill quickly <laughs> in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. But why did he even know what a ghost vagina looked like when he said that that looked like one? You know, maybe that'll come out and maybe there's another $100 million podcast, Spotify 2, that, that Joe will tell the backstory on that one. <laughs> All I know is I got silent real quick and I made sure people knew that that didn't come out of my mouth. <laughs> There you go. Until tonight, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so many clippable moments. This is not a conference. The last 10 minutes would, would not be the one part of this whole thing, which I've absolutely loved every minute. This would not be my daughter's favorite last part of the, the interview. I'll, I'll tell you that for sure. My son is cracking his ass up. But I would be like, Dad, seriously? Seriously, Dad? Come on, man. Come on. Okay, Kira. 25 going on and knowing everything. I love her. <laughs> She's an actor. Son's 22. He's a funny little fuck. And uh, he's a big Jets fan. So he's already nervous about tomorrow because they're in lost win territory at this point. And they need some help. So I told him, you get a win tomorrow night. I said, we'll help you out. Who day on Saturday against New England. And then if you're fortunate enough to play again in the playoffs, we'll beat Mike White, Zach Wilson. I know you won't put Flacco back in, Cole, but We'll beat you again. I'd be happy to do that. But he is happy that the Buckeyes might get the rematch with that school up north. Got to beat Georgia first, which is not going to be easy. Um, my biggest fear is that you would have a national championship with Woody and Bo, and Bo would go 2-0, and which is Jim Harbaugh now. Um, but that school up north, I'm a very true Buckeye. And the only thing worse than losing to him at the horseshoe would be losing again you know, in the national championship. The same man we could get some revenge in a bigger game. But George and TCU probably have a little something to say about that. Well, I have a message for your son. Um, I am very upset with the Jets because I'm a Giants fan and they did not beat the Lions. And the Lions are nipping at the butt for that wild card over there. And this could be a problem. The Lions are not losing right now. So tell him, please, these Jets can't be doing this to us Giant fans, okay? We were hurting a little bit from that. He is. Uh, he would be in full agreement with you. Um, he's not happy about it either. Um, I said, "Hey, we're both playing six and seven teams, man. I, like we're losing records." And I said, "We let like your Jets can't fuck up in the early game, and in the afternoon we can't be in Tampa and lose to the six and seven Buccaneers." And I'm watching that Lions game, and I know the Lions have obviously been on a tear. Um, but uh, Cole is not as excited about Zach Wilson. As he was missing him when he got hurt in the preseason. Let's just say that. Uh, they missed Brees Hall. And if anything the Jets can do with a win to help your Giants, I can guarantee you my son would be happy to provide <laughs> that for you. So I appreciate that. Um, tomorrow night, it's all about J-E-T-S, Jets, Jets, Jets. <laughs> all right. Well, good. You've turned me around. Good luck to the Jets. I hope they win. I hope the Bengals win as well. And um, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, I know BYB's got some big things. Is BYB done for the year? That's it for the year? Yeah. yeah. Done and for the year. Uh, we're done at Pro Box for the year. I did, man, I think we did 15 events for Pro Box TV and a ton of podcast material. Um, Paulie Malinaji, the Magic Man, the two-time world champion, is, is my guy. He reminds me of Joe in so many ways. And he's the best analyst in boxing. And so I just sit back and I listen and I learn. And I, I really do. I feel like, you know, I'm not Gretzky, but I feel like how Wayne would be when he got traded to L.A. He wouldn't walk in to that locker room way back when in 1988, I think it was, and say, hey, I'm the great one. Get out of my way. This is my stop. He walked into that locker room and he introduced himself to everybody as Wayne. And everybody knew he was fucking Gretzky. Wow. But he was Wayne. And, and that's how I've been and how I've approached the sport of boxing. And that's why... Roy Jones Jr. embraced me at, at Pro Box because he saw the respect that I had. And even I've done combat sports for over two decades, but I mean, 25 years since my first UFC. So, um, but it's it's a new sport and it's something that I'm really enjoying learning. And I and I hope to do a lot more with BYB and with Pro Box. And you know, who knows? There may be some other you know bare knuckle or you know gloved uh, organizations out there that, that I can be part of and become a soundtrack for. Um, so yeah, we're done for the year. We are going to be in Miami uh, early February, and then we are actually taking BYB. We're taking the Trigon, the smallest surface in combat sports, to Dubai oh, in wow. March, and uh, 
that'll be pretty cool. Because I remember Abu Dhabi like it was yesterday. Sean Tompkins, may he rest in peace. Everybody talked about don't get in fights, don't do anything. You know, that, that you got to be on your best behavior there. Don't hold your wife's hand. Don't do anything. And Sean's arguing with some bartender in, in Abu Dhabi. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> so that's my Sean Tompkins. That's my boy, man. Good Canadian boy with a lot of fire in him. Um, and, and obviously, you know, Sam Stout's brother-in-law, he's married to Sam's sister for many years. Um, and, and just a good dude, but yeah, we're going to Dubai and BYB with that Trigon is special. And we've got some special athletes and, um, it's not tough, man. It's not not tough, man. And that's what I really enjoy because it is bare knuckle, but it's not tough, man. These guys have some skills and they're committed to it. and, And I look forward to being on this journey with them. This is exciting, man. I, I, I think BYB and BKFC are the top when it comes to the bare knuckle yeah. sport. Both of them are doing amazing things and, and having you there with Big Mo and Paulie. And I mean, it's, it's, it's wild. The team that they got together, they got the, they have the Trigon. So that makes it even more interesting. I think you guys have an yeah. edge over BKFC when it comes to the actual fights. I mean, would you, would you say that uh, BK, I mean, I, yeah, be biased, but. Yeah, I, I would I would say that because it it makes bare knuckle even more unique. And it also, much like the octagon, when you turn it on, you flip around, is it BKB, is it BKFC, is it something like, what is it? Oh, that's BYB Extreme, that's Dada's group that he started in the backyard and now it's becoming mainstream. Now that's where Desmond Green, who was a star with the UFC, is fighting. Oh, okay. Oh, Toby Misak, who was in Bellator, good Hawaiian kid, grew up down the street from BJ Penn. Oh, oh that's right. He fights in the Trigon. So, yeah, I, the, the, the fact that we have that very unique combat surface in a 6'7 announcer, um, you know who we are the minute we come on the air. And our owner, Mike Vasquez, was kind enough to, you know, bring me aboard. Al Bernstein did events for him prior to having more – commitments with Showtime with post-COVID and being busy, but then he hires Pauli Malignaggi, hires Claudia Trejos, we bring on Big Mo. I mean, you talk about boxing, you talk about Pauli and Claudia, you're talking about people like they're stars, they're fucking superstars in the broadcast world. And oh, by the way, Pauli's two-time world champion. Mm -hmm. So Mike has put together a broadcast team that I believe will allow us to do our best to separate our product from the others. And, um, you know, it's funny. I was going through old pictures uh, the last couple of days. This, this this big day was coming, Chris, and I see a picture of me, Chris Lytle, and Cole when Cole was about eight years old. Wow. I mean, the, the bonus king. I love Chris Lytle. Sean Wheelock is a guy I've known forever. He's, uh, he's very close with Big John, and he's done a lot of things. Um, but I think we have a product that can separate itself. We just got to keep digging in and, and acting as a family. And get some other believers, get a good broadcast deal, and then uh, take over the world. And the one thing that we do have at BYB is we have a partnership with BKB in the UK. Mm-hmm. And we did a show over there. That's why I was at Shields Marshall. Uh, Big Mo, Big Mo, I, I asked Big Mo for tickets. I mean, I, you know, I'm like Goldberg, <laughs> goddammit. Like, is it, oh, can you help me out, dude? Can you, like, well, I'll see what I can do. Like, please, please, <laughs> please, I'll pay you. Like, I'll buy you a drink. He did, by the way. He got us hooked up real nicely. But, I mean, being able to do it in the UK and having those BKB guys, I mean, those Brits, I mean, it, it's spectacular. So, yeah, sky's the limit. It's going to be a big 2023 for BYB, that's for sure. That's awesome. Can't wait to see what they have in store. You guys are going to kill it as usual. And, um, Mike, thank you again for coming on. Like I said, I was very excited uh, seeing that text message from you. I appreciate uh, you sharing your stories tonight. And uh, if there's any last words to these beautiful people in the chat, now's the time to let it out. Thank you for everything. The emotions that I've had today are because of every fan who's been passionate about this sport. The emotions that I've had today have been because of the memories and the fighters and their appreciation of the way that I represent and respect them. And so it never falls upon deaf ears and it will never go without the greatest of gratitude the kindness of the combat sports fans, the people who hired me and allowed me to be on this journey, and the men and women who go in there and leave it all in the cage, in the ring, in the trigon, which is a smaller cage. Um, Thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you don't like what I do, I'm okay with that. Just love that I'm passionate 
and appreciate that I try to do the best I can at every show and I'll never come in unprepared. And uh, if you think my big combat sports announcing days are all over just like that, you're incorrect because here we go. And in 2023, I'm going to be with you and we're going to talk UFC. There we go. I love it. Oh, my God. I get, I get chills every time you do that. Mike, thank you again for coming on. I can't wait to talk soon, and let's let's link up and do this Fight Buddies together, okay? Sounds like a plan. Once we do one, we're going to do a ton, so get ready. I get annoying. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm down. You don't have to tell me twice. Mike, thank you All again. Right. <laughs> we'll talk soon, my okay? Pleasure. Have a great have night, a great Mike. holiday. Thanks for having me on, and may everyone delete in that Take that goat's vagina thing out of their mind. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they're going to be talking about that for a while, Mike. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be the focal point of the interview, unfortunately. <laughs> All right. All right, Mike, be good. Thank you, Mike Goldberg. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, what do you say? Mike Goldberg on the show. Oh, my God. It's all over. Wow. I mean, I got to be honest with you. There were points in that interview where I was going to be like, you know what? I, I was like, fuck the audience. I want to talk about hockey. I want to talk about um, football. My man, Mike, he handled every question. I mean, if you're just jumping in now, you're going to need to run it back. We Every rumor that about you know the what? UFC, him coming and going, you know, like what happened, his relationship with Joe, he was very candid. Um, he talked about the the good stuff, the bad stuff. Uh, I mean, I have so many more questions, I'm sure, uh, that I didn't get out in this interview. But um, I wanted to let him, uh, you know, tell the stories because he's a very good storyteller. And my goodness, he is jam-packed with information. Jam-packed. I, I say this after every guest, it might, one of my favorite guests, but I, I got to say this. this. This was a pleasure, an absolute pleasure. So thanks to Big Mo for making it happen. I do have some donations here. I did see some nonsense, but let me play some of these donations because I do appreciate the support here. Oh, here we go, here we go, here we go. Yeah. Oh yeah. Come on. Come on, get loud, MMA holes in the crowd. There we go. Come on, get loud, MMA holes in the crowd. Got MMA holes in the crowd. Yeah. MMA holes in the crowd. Yeah. MMA holes in the crowd. Yeah. D rest coming in. Amazing Mike for the gold. I mean, he is he is the gold one for sure. Let me go wonderful, with wonderful. the wonderful, wonderful with that. By the way, we dropped an announcement on the show that we didn't talk about. Um, he is excited about this, and, and I gotta be honest with you. A fight buddies with Mike Goldberg. Could you imagine tuning in during a fight buddies? And Mike Goldberg's doing the tail of the tape. He's doing the play by play over here. We're, we're popping some gummies, drinking some drinks. I mean, what? He's down. He said not one. He's down for multiple fight buddies. So ladies and gentlemen, one's in the chat if you're ready to break the internet with us. Because it's about to go down. It's about to go down. 2023 is going to be bonkers on this channel. So if you're subscribed to the channel, if you've been a supporter for as long as wherever you've been a supporter, thank you. And let's go along for the ride together. How many people are pumped up? I mean, that is massive. And all credit to Big Mo. Big Mo set us up here. I mean, what? What? Mike Goldberg in the house? In the building? For a fight, buddies? Could you imagine? Maybe we can get him in on the Brazil card. The first pay-per-view of the year. Maybe we could do that. I mean, Jesus. I promised six years ago with this channel. I promised everybody that you will never see anyone do what we do on this channel. I promised that. No matter what. Ups and downs, strikes or whatever. You know, knuckleheads in and out of the community. We're going to do things that no one else has done. We're going to create the best community in the world. We're going to provide the best content we could possibly give you. And we have succeeded. I am very happy about this. And meeting guys like Mike Goldberg, I mean, that is just... Wonderful, wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. What else we got over here? Wonderful, wonderful. There's Sanosi coming in. Moss, you and Mike G leaving as you'll need to meet in person even if off camera. Time to be social to the MMA world again. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, that's exactly what we we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, listen, that was the plan. So when Big Mo slipped in and he was like, listen, would you like to do something with Mike Goldberg? The first thing that jumped into my head was fight buddies. 
Like, I was like, I didn't even think interview at the time. I was like, Fight Buddies is the thing. He was the voice of the Octagon. He's always going to be the voice of the Octagon, to me at least. It's one of the reasons why I'm doing this, is because of Mike Goldberg. So, um, the, I thought Fight Buddies, and he, he, he responded right back. He's like, that's what I was thinking. Like, Big Mo, he, he got it. And like I said earlier, like Mike said earlier about Big Mo, the dude, he is, if you don't know who Big Mo is, he's this. Uh, he's been on the show multiple times. He's on our trailer. We threw him in our trailer. I mean, the guy is uh, a fucking stud, man. Young, the youngest guy in the game, the tallest guy in the game. You see him over here with Mike. I mean, Big Mo over here, He's he's got a good mind. He knows what's going on here. And we synced up, and, and he, you know, he's like, you know, let's link this thing up. And so this is all credit to Big Mo. Shout out to Big Mo. We will definitely have Big Mo back on again. Love to catch up with Mo. Uh, Cody's great. He really is a great guy. And and the way Mike was talking about, you know, Mo is like, let's go, champ. It's a good guy to have in your corner, right? Uh, D Brooker, D Brooker coming in as a member for uh, thirteen months. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Brooker. Appreciate that. Ah, oh, super chat. We got Kevin Kant coming in. When was the last time you had some cock? Uh, I'm sorry I missed that one. But we asked about his size of his cock. So. And he was, you know, he answered. Ah, oh, super chat. Alfredo. Thank you so much for all the memories, Mike. Wishing you nothing but the best. That's very Folded kind. Hands. I will pass the message along. Thank you so much for that donation, man. Really appreciate your support. Uh, yeah, I mean, who doesn't appreciate that guy, man? That guy was... Pioneer. Uh, super chat. Me and Gene. Nobody cuts better promos than Goldie. No one Brain does. gesture. You know what was, was interesting? Right in the beginning of the interview, he 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 mixed two things. Like he was, he was saying something. I can't remember. It was something like brain surgeon, but it was like rocket surgery or something. I don't know what he said, but it was in the beginning. And I and I was like, right off the bat. Like we got a Goldieism, like like, and that's why I said he's the most human. Like that's what's so lovable about him. You know what I'm saying? Some people are so perfect with with how they you know give their content, where it's like you can't relate to that person. Brain science, no. Rocket surgery, I think that's what it was. Rocket, yeah, it was rocket surgery. I mean, you just can't like that's Goldberg, man. Like he's human. You know, he's a human being, and I think that's why people loved him. When you listen to, like, and no disrespect to Anik. Listen, we, we horse around about John Anik. But John is so to the T, to the point where it just kind of is, it becomes robotic. At, at You know, I, I can't, myself, I don't relate to it as much. But Goldie, like, sometimes you wait for it. And by the way, the way he spoke about the NFL situation, there is a video that I dropped nine days ago. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, <laughs> what it was a nightmare of a night, and Mike Goldberg came on, and he he spoke about it and, and explained, you know, what was going on in his head. He didn't have to talk about that. He didn't have to talk about that, but he did. Much, much respect. Much respect. Let's go, champ. Let's go, champ, over here. Ryan Kills being a member for, or just re-upping your championship. Let's go. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Ryan Kills. Appreciate that. Very supportive of you. We got, wow, you guys are being very generous. Thank you. Johnny Hall. Wonderful, wonderful. Johnny Hall, what do you got? What do you got for me? Wow, Moss. What an interview. Thank you me. are the best interviewer in MMA. We the holes know it, but one day the MMA world will know it. Mike really poured it all out. He gave you that Michael Jordan interview. <sighs> I tell you, man. Like I said to him before, and thank you for the kind words. Really appreciate that. Um, first off, what we do on this channel is we just try to... Listen, my... My hero as a kid was Howard Stern, and I understand he's old, he's washed up, blah, blah, blah. But if you look at what he's done and how he got guests to say things, I learned so much from Howard. So my style of interviewing with people, I just want to just have a conversation, you know, just have a conversation. I have some points that I want to hit. If I don't hit them, it's okay. I'm not going to kill myself for it. But I want to make sure the guest is comfortable enough to open up. And I think Goldie was comfortable enough to open up over there and... and that's more on him, really. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to open up. So I can't just pat myself on the back and be like, oh, got him to talk. I can't do that. But uh, the fact that he did that, if you don't have a good guest, 
you have a shitty interview. That's that's basically what it comes down to, and he's just a good guest. So I'll just stay humble with that. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. You hear that jam? Ninja choke. Congrats, Chris. This is good shit. You're doing so well with these interviews, doggy. I hope I didn't scare Goldie away. <laughs> it's going to be so cool to have him hanging with you and JBM. So you're the one that dropped the Ariel donation. I was dreading it. Like, I saw it in queue, and I was like, fuck. So those long song donations, they don't really work well when you have a guest, right? Because I, I maybe I got to put the face up in the donation screen. But they're like, what is going on right now? And Mike Goldberg just did an interview today with Ariel Helwani. They're tight. They're very tight. Of course, Goldberg's not going to want to burn a bridge with Ariel. Ariel's on the top of the game. They're friends. And when that... <laughs> When, when that donation dropped, my heart dropped, <laughs> and I was looking at his face the whole time, and he was just shaking his head as Ariel Helwani was masturbating. I was like, oh, my God. But I got to say this. I have a lot of respect for you guys. The fact that you got the balls to do that. I understand I'm the one in the dunk tank having this happen to me while I have my guest on, but it's great. It's fucking great because you're not going to see an interview with Mike Goldberg and then Ariel Hawani starts beating off in it. You're not going to see that on any other YouTube channel. So shout out to Ninja Choke over there. Shout out. You win. You win. You win. I mean, you just won. You won. Well spent $7. Yeah, if you missed that, please go back. Someone timestamp it. It's hilarious. It's, it's very funny. Very, very funny. When you're doing two-hour interviews, a lot of things get lost in the shuffle. That's a, that's a little hidden gem that was very uncomfortable. Um, there's another moment when we had Ben Rothwell on, and then someone did the shop donation. That just happened there with Ben Rothwell. That was very awkward, but that was hilarious as well. Well placed. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Sinosi. Save Goldie for Khabib versus Vok in all honestly, or if John Jones fight again for nostalgia's sake. One of the last guys in the Zufar ERA also I foresee 100k faster with him plus. Did you need temp mods for such an event? Gonna be chaos in there dot maybe more than JRE? Dude, I, I'm telling you, Goldberg on a uh, Fight Buddies, um, dude, that's, that's, that's magic right there. That, that's, that's a magical thing. And yeah, I, I do want to calculate it. I want to do it on a day. <laughs> I can't wait until he shows up and sees we're doing this in a bedroom. Like he's going to see the setup and he's going to be like, what the fuck? I used to be cage side to the UFC. Now I'm stuck in a, in a hot bedroom with, I mean, you don't see it. You, I'm in this magical room right now. But what he's going to see, <laughs> it's going to be like, I drove over here for this. But um, it's going to be wild, man. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be wild. I, I tell you what, man, like I would like multiple guests. Like, could you imagine like you got Goldie in here, you got a fighter in here. I mean, that's just I think that's the future. So as we upgrade in what we're doing, as we grow as a channel, I promise you, we said this from the beginning, we're gonna be doing fight buddies with with pretty important people. And, and the fact that Goldie's on board, I mean, I think we've we've skipped a couple of stages. <laughs> I think we skipped a couple of stages there. Thank you, Sonosi. Wonderful, wonderful. Kainoto. Moss, this might have skyrocketed to number one on my favorite show so far. Wow. When a guest has this chat on its best behavior, you know the content is top notch. No time to goof off, except for that goat pussy donation. Congratulations. <laughs> well, it was weird because it was like a very cordial conversation. Then I was like, okay, hard hitting question time. And he, f he fucking, he handled it superbly. And then it turned into how big is his dick? Let's watch Ariel beat off. Like, that's the format over here. And the fact that he stuck through, it was great. Thank you. That's uh, very nice of you, Kainoto. Appreciate that. That means a lot. That does. That means a lot. Uh, let's see what else we got over here. BK coming in. Let's go, champ. A member. Just membered up. Let's go, champ. BK. BK. B -b 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 BK. Yeah, baby. Thank you so much, BK, for the membership. Appreciate that. If you want to hit the membership, join down below. Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, where'd that go? Off subject. That fight study vid I linked in the Discord who are the best analysts in the UFC. 
The fact they excluded you and gave the wheelchair one S <laughs> cracks me up. Nine two one. Who were the two L's this year? Uh oh fuck, who was it? It was Kamaru and Oh, I was wrong with um Oh no, so nine two and alright, so it was eight three and one. Because, but then I did bet on Nganu. So I picked Gon in Tapology, but I bet on Nganu. Anyway, the video, I'm not even going to fucking pay any attention to that. So here's the thing. Let me just say this, and thank you. That was Sinosi, by the way, with the $2 donation. Appreciate that. I'm telling you right now, people are deathly afraid of us. It's been like this for many years. We're doing something here that it's not going to, it's not sexy to give attention to. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because we're obnoxious. We got crazy graphics. We got goofy songs. We got a wild community in here. It's not sexy to put out there and pat on the back. So I, I think uh, it's it's all good. I don't need other people to fucking make videos about me. I don't give a shit about any of that stuff. All I care about is putting out good content because as you can see, the, the subscribers come no matter what. We're building a great community over here. Uh, we got great guests. Uh, we do the best fight reaction on the internet. We've been doing it for six years strong. We actually started it. Joe Rogan did the Fight Companion. We're the first fully interactive fight show on YouTube. No one has done what we did. Like, even Rogan. Like, Rogan did a, you know, a Fight Companion with his buddies. Hey, watch me talk to my friends while fights are on. But we said, let's double down. Let's triple down. Let's do a show where we actually tell you what's going on. Let's do a show where the chat is front and center over here. And we get to talk to the audience and see what you think about these fights. No one's doing that. No one is doing that. So people are scared of the MMA holes, and it's fine. It makes me feel good about what we're doing over here. Now, let me take a quick break, and then when we come back from this break, I want to touch on Chel Sonnen, who actually responded to the MMA holes today. We'll talk a little more UFC. We'll talk a little more Goldie, if you'd like. But um, let me take a quick break, and we'll come right back over here. Thank you guys for stopping by. And a quick word from our sponsors. By the way, Sinosi's belt is looking fire. This belt. Wait until you see Sinosi's belt. This shit that from the strap to the plates on this thing, this thing is bonkers. So the first Fuqua Friday champion belt, when you get a look at this thing. Now we're going to play our ads over here, our sponsors. One of our sponsors is Undisputed Belts. So big shout out to Undisputed Belts. They're the ones that are supplying our belts for the year. Sinosi's belt is ridiculous. The goat milk belt is ridiculous. Now, Prozac, wherever the fuck you are, get your ass in our, our DMs or at the MMA Holes or on Discord or in our email, uh, the MMA Holes info at gmail.com. The MMA Holes info at gmail.com. Give us your information so we can send you your belt. If not, you vacate. And it goes to the second place one, which is my dad. So slide in there, Prozac. You have until, uh, we're going to give you until, I don't know, we'll give you until Sunday. And then that's it, man. Okay? Sunday, Sunday, Sunday is what we're going to give you too. So Prozac, find Prozac and let's get him his strap. All right, let's take this break. I'll be right back. And uh, we'll talk a little Chael Sonnen versus the MMA holes. Cause I'm a CBDX.com boy. We sell legal Delta ATAC. We 
It will get you very strong. We sell gummies, yeah. Buzz base oil in a set. And they post on Twitter. Oh, yeah. Hey, on CBDX.com. You better get with them. You're going to get real high. You're going to get that tree. You're going to get real down loud from the Ooh, island boys. You're going to get all down. It's so from the ground. You be smoking, but you be smoking trees with a different breed. You smoking green and purple, and then you could have hurt. Yeah, it's yeah. Hurt. You better get with CBDX.com Cause we some CBDX.com boy You better tap in on the website right. Island boy Right now When it comes to underwear, there's nothing more important than comfort. Why empty your pockets for generic underwear that loses comfort, quality, and style when you can slip into a pair of sheath and get even more out of your daily wear? With sheath underwear, you can treat your jewels like royalty as they are given their own private sanctum, keeping them secure and you in a state of bliss. Get 20% off sheath now using promo code MMAHOLES. That's M-M-A-H-O-L-E-S with the link in the description below. And for the ladies... Absolutely! Sheath isn't just for men. Ladies can now experience Sheath's style, comfort, and functionality too. Sheath for Women is crafted using a signature modal elastine fabric blend for form-fitting breathability that will not affect the natural pH environment or the microclimate of the skin while producing that long-lasting, unimpeded comfort. Use promo code MMAHOLES, M-M-A-H-O-L-E-S, for 20% off at sheathunderwear.com. Sanosi, his ass is getting up in this ad. He's coming up in this ad. Look at the champs. The champs. So that's undisputedbelts.com. Yeah. What a song. If you missed Mike Goldberg, you're definitely going to have to run that back. Make sure you have some time put aside because we had a very nice, long two-hour conversation, and it was wonderful, wonderful. wonderful, wonderful. He, he said it all. He said it absolutely all. Uh, so once again, thank you, Mike Goldberg, for coming on and uh, just linked up real quick. After the holiday, we're going to put it... The fuck? Wonderful, wonderful. That caught me off guard. Where is this coming in from? Nine to two O oh, R three minus one. I figured Usman was one. Cannot recall the other. But that does show a testament of how often you're wrong on the main event. Bigger under you called right this year. My biggest W for an event I think was Katar versus Skiga or Chris Barnett W. Yeah, so I was in in this video, I was 8, 3, and 1. And the video, thank you, Sonosi. They, it was all like... <laughs> It was all these MMA analysts, now legit ones, former fighters, and then they throw Knucklehead in there as well. But um, I'm like, I'm looking at this, I'm like, I'm so much better than these guys. I don't want to pat myself on the back, but I'm like, I did better than like all these motherfuckers. So I, I, I don't know. It is what it is. I'm not going to hang my hat on predictions. I call myself Mystic Moss. Sometimes I gloat a little bit about it, but um, I don't like to hang, like specifically hang my hat on it because, um, you know, I don't want people to bet the house on my predictions because god forbid they do it on the time where it's the three instead of the eight you know so do it responsibly but thank you sonosi appreciate that thank you guys for the donations tonight seriously hmm decaf jesse said a nice she said something very nice to me she she complimented the interview so that was nice we had a nice moment look at that it just feels weird like it, it feels weird when i get compliments on an interview because it's just like i don't know 
Like, I never think it's good. I'm just like, ah, people hate this. Especially when we talk in the hockey stuff. I was like, ah, I'm losing everybody. But I loved it. Like, I love talking to these people. So it was, it was really cool talking to Mike Goldberg. And go give him a follow on Instagram. It's Goldie on TV. Go give him a follow over there on IG and Twitter and all those places. Uh, speaking of, t- <laughs> we showed him the virtually identical. <laughs> Dude, that was hilarious. I was dying to show him that. Like, I wanted to know. Like, that's like one of my favorite UFC memes is uh, virtually identical. So the fact that he spoke about that was just, I don't know. I got, I got, I got freaking chills. Uh, okay. Let's see. Let's see. So today, Chael Sonnen put something out. It, it kind of shocked me. He put something out where he did an interview with Douglas Crosby. Now, I only listened to first five minutes. I didn't, I didn't get too far into it. Because I was like, ah, oh, bummer, man. I, I realized that they were like friends, right? So I knew he wasn't going to ask the questions. Now, listen, I like Mike Goldberg. I, the people that I interview, I, it's not like I don't like those people. Um, and even if I create a relationship with them or anything like that, if there is a question that needs to be asked, I'm going to fucking ask it. And, and I, hold on a second here. One, Got one, a little ninja choke. I was stuck at work for the fight Saturday, but did you see Seb Nurming the maid of hit the ninja choke? That was gangster shit. <laughs> Thanks for the fire interview, Zem OS. Thank you. Thank you, Ninja Choke. Appreciate that donation, man. I did. I did. It was pretty it was pretty fire. Um appreciate that. But um listen, so I had my opinions on Douglas Crosby over here. I didn't go too crazy. The one I did go crazy was the Bellator fight. I, I was I didn't know what he was watching with that one over there, but Here's the thing with the criteria and what what Doug has said. I understand it's there's some it's some blurriness with how people are scoring fights and and judges see one thing one way, some other judges see things the other way. It just seems like it's not just one or two fights. There's a lot of fights where the Douglas Crosby's involved and there's controversy. And when there's more than a handful of fights, you start scratching your head like what's going on here. So Chell had him on his podcast and it was like two good buddies talking and it was just like Okay, we're going to get into this. And a lot of beating around the bush happened. So I was disappointed in Uncle Chell, man. Because Chell, is, he doesn't hold back. You know what I'm saying? Like, And I would love to interview. I, I spoke to Chell very briefly when in the Channel First started. And that's when he called it the MMA Hose. And he did a quick, like, a very quick live stream interview. You can go back in our playlist, MMA Superstars. You can find Uncle Chell there. And that was five years ago. So go check that out. That was the last time we spoke. I would love to interview Chell. Like, I would legit love. I have nothing but respect for Chell. Um, he's one of the reasons why I watched the UFC. Like, I got into it when Chell had the grudge against Anderson. I wasn't from UFC 1. I got in when, when he was talking about Anderson playing in puddles in Brazil. I thought it was hilarious. Chell Sonnen is, is, is hilarious. He was such a fun fighter to watch. He's done a great thing on YouTube. So I threw a little criticism out there because I was disappointed, man. I, when, when I saw that he's interviewing, he says exclusive interview, right? And he says, MMA super judge Doug Cro- Douglas Crosby joins me for a chat. I'm like, what? Super judge? And then I start listening. I'm like, they're just sucking each other off. What? What is that? That's not Chell. What's going on here? So we put out a tweet. And the tweet says. I'm just got to scroll back. Where is it? Where is the tweet? Uh, here it is. So all I said, and I, I think this is fair, listen to <laughs> listen to Chell take a few L's as an interviewer. Now, me with my pristine interviewing skills, you know, I at least I, I think I have a right to say it. I'm one of the best in the game. No, I'm just I'm just I'm just being an asshole right now. But like I was disappointed in Uncle Chell, man. I was like, damn, bro, you dropped the ball. What are we doing? I, what? You had Douglas Crosby on. Get him. Get him. Put his back against the wall. Make him answer. And he didn't. Like, Douglas danced around it. And I get it. You know, you're as good as your guest is. Like, if your guest is not going to give you the information, I get it. There's just so much you could press them. But I feel like he could have pressed a little bit more. And he didn't. So Chael responded. Chael responded. We go over to Chael's Twitter. And he says, I forgive you. Well, Chael, I forgive you too. You are forgiven as we're 
I take it back. Didn't expect that. I didn't expect I. I didn't expect you to forgive me. I was very nice of you. There's really not much I could say now. Can't really criticize you anymore because you forgive me. You took the high road. And I'm going to pump the brakes and say thank you. I forgive you as well, Uncle Chill. It's all good. Every time you got a bad, you know, you have a bad day here and there. You had a bad day. And I forgive you. Chat, what do you think over here? Did you see the Jesse on fire stored uh, in Crosby and Chael? No, I didn't. Did he post it today? I, he popped in our community section. Did he post one today? I, I, Jesse did have something that was like drama with Crosby. I did not watch it, but I did, I did see in the, the title. He said something about drama with Crosby, so I don't know what he posted on Crosby. But did he? I mean, I don't know. Doug, uh, Doug Crosby doesn't seem like the most stable of people when you look into it. Uh, edgy bruh. Don't let him catch you at the hotel. Yeah, some people were saying that. Chell's actually a very nice person. When I met him, he was very nice. I don't know him well, you know, but the, the, the little bit that I did meet him is nice. And, and Mike Oberg said how nice he was as well. How is Ellie doing uh, with Santa and Christmas? She she doesn't really know who Santa is yet. Oh, she does? Oh, yeah, she yeah she kind of knows. She goes, da da. Like, she, yeah, she's like that at that stage. She's so adorable saying these little things for the first time now. You could be the third party to testify after Chell breaks your head. <laughs> Chell's not breaking. He forgave me. Why would he break my head? He forgave me. He's a lovable teddy bear. Love Uncle Sonin. $80 pay-per-view in 2023. Very possible. Very, very possible. Hit the like button. Hit that like button over here. Kainono coming in with a donation. Mike Goldberg is part of MMA law, not just the UFC. It will be surreal to watch when Tam him call the fights. That might be the match that ignites the whole show on fire. I can't wait for your first collab. Dude, I mean, that will be fun. <laughs> now I can go to sleep, Joe forgave you. <laughs> he forgave me. I mean, I'm not going to die in a hotel lobby. Or, I don't know. Thank you, uh, Kainoto. Appreciate that. Yeah, dude. Goldie on the fucking Fight Buddies is nuts. It's nuts. Uh, okay, what else have we got? So I didn't anticipate going as long as I did, and I'm happy we did because I enjoyed talking to Mike for as long as we did. I did put a poll out. I didn't show to him this. I should have. But I, we, we, we spoke enough about Anik and whatever. I don't feel like we need to beat that dead horse. But if you are interested in the poll, I said if you could put recency bias aside, who is the better voice of the Octagon? Uh, out of 1,700 votes so far, Goldie at 42%, Anik 58%. I gotta be honest with you, this is kind of a dub for Goldie because Anik has been doing it for a while. There's a lot of people that voted that probably never even heard Goldberg fight because they're new to the game. A lot of people in our community just got into it. I, we get messages all the time, hey, I, I just been watching for a couple of months. So a lot of people have not uh, enjoyed Goldberg. So the fact that still 40% of the community are still Team Goldie is pretty pretty special, I think at least. Um, I don't know. I guess you can call it a moral victory over there. But what do you guys think about this poll? What do you think about Goldie at 42%? I mean, I think Goldie should be 100%. You know? I mean, I used to get chills when Goldie... I mean, if you look at the highlights and all that stuff, the here we go, it's all over. Come on. By the way, we found out if he says those things during sex. Run back the interview if you want to hear it. That's what it is now. Uh, no way that poll actually reflects the truth. Uh, the 58%. Today, UFC has gone woke. I hate it. You think the UFC is woke? Not even close. They might hear Goldie in uh, clips, but UFC will dub some. Do they? They don't dub them out, do they? Imagine they dub Mount put Anik in there. That would be a massive slap in the face. I haven't heard that yet. Go back to Goldberg and listen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you haven't heard Gold, Goldie and, and, and Rogan, you know what I love about the two of them? Because I was going back and listening to some of the old stuff and refreshing my memory. I talked to my buddy that used to do the show with us in the beginning, and he was like, that's fucking cool, man. Like, it's, like you think of Goldberg. I don't know. Like, when we were watching it, I didn't need to watch a fight companion. We had Gold and Rogan together. Like, they were great. And they did. They bickered. Like, they went back and forth. It calls... There were some iconic calls where both of them were just screaming over each other. And that's great. Like, now you got three guys screaming all over each other. You know? So, 
It's not easy. Like think of it, like we do it from home. We don't have the craziness. Like we've only called regional events, but we we haven't done it in the UFC. I couldn't even imagine. Like trying to hold it together. And then you got your boy, buddy next to you. You're all screaming and yelling because something crazy just happened in front of you. But Goldie always kept it together. And he was like, the, it's all over. And my God, it gives you chills. What are your thoughts on Jake Shields and Mike Jackson incident? You know, I had strong feelings about it because of our situation with Mike Jackson. And now I'm kind of over it. I think they should get a room and se- have sex together. Because it's just like every other tweet is them tagging each other and shitting on each other. It's like, all right. All right. I think we're, I, I'm team Jake, but um, it's like enough. Like Twitter's gone crazy with that stuff. So, yeah. But of course I'm going to be team Jake because of our history at Mike Jackson. Ariel Helwani is boring. Well, listen, say what you want. Did you hear his Dylan Dennis thing today? That was interesting. I tell you what, I got to give Dylan, I'm not a Dylan Dennis fan, but I was laughing. Dylan Dennis had me laughing. The shit that he was saying to Ariel, I, I was literally in the gym chuckling, listening to it. So I got to give Dan his credit. He's a knucklehead, but um, I, I, he made me laugh. They were really going at it. And then it got to the point where it's just like they were just going too far. You know, they it just kept going and going and going with their banter. So it might have went a little too, you know, too long, but yeah. Millennials infiltrate UFC and now fighters uh, wear makeup and pearls. I do think that stars now aren't stars that they were before. Like O'Malley's doing a great job and, you know, Israel Adesanya and, um, I don't know, Patty Pimblett, you know, like the, the, the guys, the big names now, they're doing a good job, but it still doesn't feel like the old days. It doesn't like, I don't feel the buzz that I did with a Ronda fight, Connor fight. I don't feel like, I mean, especially Connor, like, I don't feel that I get excited. Don't get me wrong. I'm not like I hate the UFC. I love the UFC. But it's just like it's still when Goldie was doing it, it, it was different. It was a whole different era. And and when the actually towards the end, it got crazy. It got crazy. Right into the merge. It got nuts. And then it kind of like hit this weird superstar wall. Did great with the pandemic. I thought they handled the pandemic perfectly. But pay-per-views have significantly dropped. It's not because of the economy, it's because of that superstar power. And now you have shows like ours that pop up that are doing fight reactions and people aren't even watching the fights anymore. They're watching us and not watching the fights. Like, they're watching us. So, you know, the UFC's got to... They've got to promote their stars a little bit better and get Goldie back. That's, that's, my, that's my recommendation to the UFC. All right, if there's anything you want to talk about in the chat, because I'm not... I mean, we went way longer than I expected... But um, if there's anything you guys want to talk about, drop it in the chat now. I'm not going to dive into We just had a fun time with Goldie, and uh, I think I'm going to start winding it down. But if there's anything you guys want to talk about with whatever's in the news or, or anything like that, let me know. Get your words heard. Wonderful, wonderful. Sinosi. I'm curious. I know you say it fact about what do you think it takes to become a Lesnar, McGregor, or Ronda Rousey type. Or perhaps just this year and make it impossible now cause of social media? So, it is, is a, is a, I don't know how to explain it. Like, O'Malley has it, but it's like, there's like a, uh, a block on it. It just, it's, it's not, there's more that can be released. What's that? Yeah, like Jesse says, he's watered down. The The problem with O'Malley is there have been times where the mic has been passed to him and he just kind of froze. Happened a lot, actually. And that's where he could have taken from what the superstar that he is right now to the next level. And he he hasn't seized those moments. That I'm not here to take part, I'm here to take over. Or Ronda Rousey, the way she used to enter, like uh, march her way to the fucking cage by that puss face to that fucking... You're like, you know, in the song, like it was like the thing. And then she was the one that was finishing all these girls. So she backed it up with the finishes. Who is doing that? Patty's not doing it. He almost lost his last fight. Izzy just lost. Um, Sean O'Malley is one fight away from a title. He Maybe he'll waits and gets a title shot. But Aljo will fuck him up. 
Aljo is your champion. Aljo is going the cringe route, but he is stumbling back with some of the things he does on social media. They're not doing everything right, and that's what you have to do. And it's it can't be easy. Like it just goes to show you with guys like I mean now Brock, he had the WWE. He was already a star. So when he got in there and was fucking people up in the UFC, I mean, that was a wrap. He's a big, monstrous guy with a sword on his chest with no neck, killing people that already is a star. I mean, you know, he had that. Who in the UFC right now is hitting everything out of the park? No one. There are stars, yes. And there are people I'm very excited to watch fight, and I love the UFC. I still love the UFC. But there has there's nothing even close to Connor, Ronda, Block, Brock. There's nothing when it comes to star power. I'm not saying a level of fighter. There's nothing close to that star power right now. It's a shame. You have Hamza, but what happens? He misses weight by nine pounds. That's a problem. It's a problem. Nate Diaz is a fairly big star. You know, he took a couple of L's along the way. And now he's not even in the UFC. But he was might have been the last of what like, was holding on to that stuff. Jorge Masvidal fell apart. Who is the guy or gal? You have potential. I'm not saying O'Malley's not going to ever turn into that. Because he's still young. But not right there yet. The show saved me uh, from my life crime. Life of what? Life of crime. I stopped pirating fights. In favor of MMA Hole's commentary. Let's go. Let's go. We saved you. We saved you. You make him lose the fight terribly inside of the cage. You make him spread his ass cheeks. Now you enter his oh backstage. God. Whoa. And you fill it with your rage. Come on. Style bender one fight. <laughs> Izzy is in Sakosta. Izzy is in Sakosta. Good thing this one's been slipping. <laughs> R.I.P. Vandalay, Fiddle, Chuck, Shogun, Nogueira, Crow Cop, BJ, Ben, and so many more. Pussies these says forget too much. <laughs> so, I did he hate to be the one to say this. So let me just say this. All those guys that you mentioned, legends. Legends. Absolute legends. But was the UFC as popular then as it is now? No. As good as they were, and as, as the star power that they had at the time, they still weren't what Ronda and Connor did. Like Ronda and Connor brought in casuals that the UFC's never seen before. You know? It's 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 pretty nuts. And Brock, too. Like, it's pretty nuts with those three brought into the UFC when it comes to just that casual. Now, those those guys, I mean, legends. Absolute legends. And Silva being, like, one of my all-time favorites. But, um, yeah, it still wasn't, you know, what these, these, guys, these guys brought. So, I'm hoping, like, I hope Hamza can't pull it together. Make weight. I'm hoping Sean O'Malley kind of... He doesn't have to make up a shtick. He's already got his gimmick. I hope when he hits the mic, fuck, he hits it out of the park. Because I feel like that's where we're, we're lacking with Sean. He's got his podcast, so he talks a lot. So, I don't know. But it seems like any time in that big situation when the mic gets in front of him, like I'm like waiting for it. I'm like, okay, here's the time. Whether it's a press conference, whether it's a post-fight speech. And it's like he doesn't see... At least Patty seizes it. But Patty has shown that he's very beatable. So it's like, it's this balance that they got to, it's not easy. It goes to show you, it's, it's just not easy. Muhammad Ali, like think what that man did. He lost, but think what he did. That guy was larger than life, you know? So I don't know. I'm hoping that the UFC, uh, I'm, I'm, it's just a matter of time before someone pops up that everyone's just going to be like, the world's going to stop for this person. I don't think they're right here yet. yet. You know, I don't think... That is the case. You possessed me when you gave me a heart, heart back. Wait, <laughs> I want more. I need it now. I need a priest to pray while holding the Bible and holy water <laughs> bottle. I'm tied up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. Oh, Bo Nickel. Wonderful, wonderful. You got a shot. 
You got a shot. So what you're saying need external power like WWE, Brock, or boxing, if one was prime, domination, personality and quotable phrases. Obviously highlight finish help to all go off like GSP and Silver, but not the legendary one million draw. Yeah. When GSP fought, there was a little time that I was not excited. Now, in hindsight, the guy's a freaking legend. Like, you look at his topology, you're like, damn, bro. Like, what? And he avenged his losses. Like, I mean, GSP is arguably the GOAT. But at the time, when there was a GSP fight, there were a couple of times I'm like, oh, here we go. <laughs> like, I, I did that with Mighty Mouse, too. And then towards the end, Mighty Mouse kind of picked it up, and I loved Mighty Mouse. But, you know, stars... Caution to, like Michael Chandler, for instance. If Michael Chandler wins a belt in the UFC, that's a guy that people will love or hate. But that's a guy that could be a mega superstar. It's just he can't fucking get past, you know? He's too busy putting on the performance and making people dazzled by him in the carnage. Michael Chandler... Maybe Drew Dober. I don't know. Drew Dober, the problem with him, though, he's, he's kind of lackluster on the mic. He's not a good interview. But damn, he's fun in the cage. Like, you need the mix of both. That was the thing with Connor. When Connor goes in there, win or lose, the dude is looking to take your head off. He's willing to just blow his load in the first round to take your head off. And that's that. Bo Nickel's interesting. The hump that Bo Nickel's going to have is he's not international, he's from the U.S. When you're working with the whole a whole country behind you, the UFC is so spread out. But if 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 Bo was he's got a little bit against him just because of that, but he can be a star, there's no doubt about it. And even Dana said that, like you know, there like maybe even O'Malley might be suffering from this. You know, when you have a country behind you, it's a different story. You know, Ronda was U.S. Yeah, but Ronda was a pioneer for women's MMA. Brock Lesnar came from WWE. Like there's. There's catches. Who is the pure U.S. guy that was that crazy superstar? I'm talking about you get in an elevator. That person doesn't watch the UFC but knows who you're talking about, superstar. John Jones could have been that guy. See, here's the problem with Liddell. I agree. I agree. But if I go out in the street right now and I say, hey, who's Chuck Liddell? I don't think people are going to know. Unless you're a UFC fan, of course, you're going to know. But I, I think like the casual, like if I asked my mother-in-law who Chuck Liddell is, she would look at me like I have seven heads. You know, it's a shame. But if Chuck Liddell was in the UFC now, might have been a different story. Couture might have been a dis different story now. Like, listen, they were big. Don't get me wrong. But I'm talking about I walk out. I go to the grocery store. I tap a lady on the shoulder or some random dude and ask you, hey, who, you know. Maybe now it would be different with social media. You know? Maybe now, now it would be a lot different. But at that time, think about it, The UFC wasn't as big as it. Like, the UFC is massive now. When you have boxers wanting to fight UFC guys, there's a reason. It's, it's, it's huge. You know? It's huge. But it's a fascinating debate because the UFC is doing great right now. It's not like the UFC is doing anything wrong. Like, people don't like paying the pay-per-views. Um, you know, it is expensive to consume, but I love the product. I would be devastated without the UFC. I absolutely love it. I had someone rip it on me because they said I, I always shit on the UFC. I fucking love it. I absolutely love the UFC. You know, we just talk about little things here and there, how it could be a little bit better. You know, how is it back then than it is now? Like, is this guy going to be a star? Is that guy going to be a star? You know. Wonderful, wonderful. Kai Noto. I've been on this trip since if one. I think sometimes it goes like this. The less you have, the more it's worth. It's oversaturated with all things MMA right now, and I think that's why the buzz just isn't there. Ten years ago, we cherished every card. Yeah, you know what? That could be it, too. There is a fight card every weekend. There's a million other organizations now. Like, you got your Bellators. You even got Bare Knuckle, like, jumping in. The mix and there's all these regional events that are getting doing gimmicks to make that interesting as well. So maybe that's the problem too. Maybe there's more options and 
Could be it. Could be it. But it is interesting. It is interesting to talk about. All right, listen. I mean, I went way too long tonight. I appreciate you guys stopping by. Big shout out to Mike Goldberg. If you missed the interview, run it back. Or if I missed your comments during the stream, when the stream is done, over and processed, in the comment section down below, let me know what you think. I want to know everything that you think about the interview. Timestamp your favorite moments. Because if there are some good moments that you thoroughly enjoy, we're going to clip them. We're going to clip those moments. So if they're in any stream, if there's something that you enjoy, a timestamp is very simple. You just put the mark. So say, for instance, if the video is... A lot of people don't know how to timestamp, so let me show you this. If you're watching a YouTube video, for instance, this one right here, of course. Let's see if my internet works out with me. So you go to a specific part over here. So like one, uh, one hour, seven, 32. You just type it in the chat, the exact same thing. One colon zero seven colon three two. It lights up blue. Bang, we can click on it. And then people could run back and watch because some people don't have the time to sit through two hours. So if you want people to know specific information, whether it's Mike Goldberg talking about his penis or Mike Goldberg talk, talking about his fondest moment in the UFC, timestamp it down below. And it helps us too because we'll take those moments and if we know you like it, we'll clip it and re-upload it on shorts and other spots on social media so we can you know spread the word. All right, guys? So that's how you can give back. Hit the like button, of course. Timestamp the videos. Tell me what you thought in the comments section down below. And we will interact with you guys and, you know, see what you got, what your thoughts are. Wonderful, wonderful. Sidosi. This month hiatus, I would love having these kind of debates. Tackling the other eras and who would had thrive now. Fook, I may need to stream talking about it. Goldberg interview got me in a certain mood plus <laughs> the hiatus. So many ideas till Jan 16th. Absolutely. By the way, Sanosi, thank you for the donation. When you get that belt, this is what I'm going to need for you. This is your homework. When you get that belt, I need a clear quick, uh, picture. Just put some, I don't know, do it outside, wherever there's light. I don't need it in a dark alley or whatever. I need it in light. I need to see this belt, whether it's on your shoulder, around your waist. I don't care how you're going to show it. But show the belt off with yourself because I want to put you in the commercial. Also, if you unbox this belt... If you want to do it on a live stream, we'll show it on air. And maybe I'll even take clips of that and throw it in our, our advertisement as well. All right. So, um, and the clear picture we'll put on our uh, live chat page over here because you're owed a spot, an extra spot here. So we will put you on the rotation here. But yeah, give us a nice clean picture of that belt. I think you're going to like it. Maybe nude, but just cover the crotch. Fine. Um, but thank you again for your support. Thank you, everyone that donated. Thank you, everyone that hit the like button. And uh, this is right around the corner. Don't like, we're going to blink and this will be here. The UFC will be back in no time. We got a ton of content coming your way. So we'll keep going live for you guys. And uh, thank you to the sponsors as well. The promo code is MMAHOLES. Uh, and thank you, Julian Lane, for coming on. Of course, Mike Goldberg, you're the fucking man. And don't be an a hole, be an MMA hole. It's all over.